Doctor Art of Thinking. Hello, this is Greg Scorzo, and you're listening to the Coda Publishing Podcast. In this podcast, we'll be talking to Australian journalist and writer Antonella Gamboto Burke about her book Mama, Love, Motherhood, and Revolution. We'll be discussing many of the issues raised in that book, issues such as Antonella's experience becoming a mother, the devaluation of the feminine, attachment parenting, whether it's useful to value female beauty, fractured intimacy, the emotions behind sex work, oxytocin and love, whether personality is more a product of nature or nurture, the specific role of the mother during infant and toddler years, whether you can spoil an infant or toddler, whether or not nannies are problematic, emotional literacy, and the role of consumer culture in changing how we parent. It's good to finally meet you. Yes, finally we meet. Well, normally what I do is I have a little chat with my guests and then we go into the uh, core of what it is we'll be discussing, which in this case is your book, Mama, Love, okay. Mother, and Revolution. Okay. Shall we begin? Yes, well, um, it's, it's very comforting in a strange way to talk to somebody who knows what it's like to uh, feel suicidal like I did. So that's an interesting way of, of starting things. Um, tell me, tell me about your experience. Well, I was suicidal quite frequently as a teenager. Yep. Uh, which is actually quite common. I, that's what I've discovered since. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I tried to do it a few times, and uh, luckily oh. I didn't because I was uh, very uncourageous at that age, which is a good thing. Cowardice sometimes can be a lifesaver. And um, I didn't do it for reasons that actually kind of link up to where I'm at now. So I'm quite pleased I didn't do it. Okay. How did you do it? How did you try to do it? Um, overdosing on pills. Benzos or other pills? I just I took a random uh, sampling of whatever was in the um, medicine cabinet at that time and took a hundred of them, uh. and I threw them all up. So. It was of uh, no consequence. I never even told my parents. Wow. How old were you? Twelve. Twelve? Yeah. Serious. I was not a happy kid, no. Yeah, clearly. Well, what I'm hearing not so much is that you weren't a happy kid, but that your parents didn't know what they were doing. That's what I'm hearing. Well, I don't know the extent to which that is or is not true. Um, because I don't know what they could have done differently given their specific limitations. That's what I mean. They did the best they could. Um, That's a different thing, but the point is they didn't know what they were doing. Yeah, well, I wouldn't know what to do if I was in the situation of being the parent to young me either. So I have sympathy if they didn't know what to do. Yeah, but they created you. I think you're, you're misunderstanding how it works. The parents actually sculpt the child um the the capacity of the child for happiness is created by the mother in particular and the father feeds into the mother so that's actually how it works and if the father doesn't pull his weight with the mother the mother starts and the community by the way this isn't just the nuclear family the mother starts falling apart she actually doesn't have the almost the grandeur of the passion that a woman has to has to be able to develop for her child it is not um, something that can happen without support that's what my book mama is all about Mm -hmm. because women are not supported and in turn fathers are not supported by the wider community and so the family unit has to break apart because the degree of attention that a child needs, a little child in particular, it obviously lessens as they get older, but the first three years in particular, almost a form of psychosis, um, where if it's permitted by 
the father and the family. Or unless the woman's extremely unusual, um, the, the degree of attention you have to pay to the child. And the thing is, without that attention, without that love psychosis, if you will, um, I mean, I use that term in a humorous sense because it's love psychosis. But it's it's it. I mean, I mean it in terms it, contextually in terms of a life, you know, um, the intensity of the passion, the intensity of the attention um, of the flow, the energetic flow between a woman and her baby is just unrivaled. I mean, it's it's the most intense. If you can take them, for those who don't, you don't have a child? Uh, not biologically, no. I have two stepchildren. Okay, it's a different thing. It's a different thing. Um, biologically, because everything happens hormonally when they're your children biologically. Your whole, I was astonished. I had no interest in kids before I had Bethesda. None. I was not, <laughs> my babysat once. <laughs> one of my oldest girlfriends had two daughters and um, one of whom's just qualified as a barrister in London actually and this was the one I babysat she was I think five or six and by the end of that night my girlfriend came home with her husband and she said here's the money and I said keep it I never want to do this again <laughs> just, really? I'm, I am done <laughs> just never ever doing this again i was out of my depth i had no skills with with um you know with this child with other children no interest either i mean i remember going out to dinner with two women both of whom had children and um, one of them said you know antonella i was in my mid-30s i think at the time and she said um you know antonella don't you feel you're missing out not having children and i'm like no i've got my career which i passionately love i think you know you guys are just readers your beaters your people who couldn't quite cut it i didn't go into this degree of detail but it was yes this whole concept which is that they women who had children were women who couldn't cut it professionally so this is interesting so did you feel superior to women who had children I certainly did. That's what that's why I wrote Mama, because I had completely inherited my father's value system and the wider culture's value system, which is that the meaning, the highest meaning, the highest truth that could be found in any life was professional success. That was my way of operating. I just like children to me seemed like this pathetic, inferior, bestial, secondary thing that people who hadn't really had success did to give, you know, to feel that they were somehow worthwhile. That was absolutely the way I saw the world. We, my, a girlfriend of mine at the time who was uh, probably Australia's most important magazine editor. Mm -hmm. And I, well, she and I used to meet out for dinner and we were both childless at the time. And um, we used to call them breeders. We literally used to refer to them as breeders. Ah, oh, the breeders, oh, she's a breeder. You know, as if they were cows or something. I had no idea. I didn't question anything. I didn't, it was just about work. I was quite a hype bud. I was called by the National Broadcasting Association, Australia's highest profile print interviewer. And I was, I was on TV a lot. I was on radio a lot. I was, you know, career, 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 career. And well, you're, that was- you're predominantly in interviewing celebrities and, and rock stars and things like that? Yeah, I did. I was also a literary critic. I also wrote essays, but I was a print. This was the golden age of magazines. You, you, you know, that doesn't exist anymore. I mean, this was- a time, this was the 90s when um, magazines, for those who were slightly too young to understand the relevance of magazines in, in that era, they were literally a source of excitement when a magazine, a certain magazine would hit the stands or in England when the enemy, the rock 
um, magazine, uh, paper would hit the stands. It made news everywhere. It made the news. Stuff that happened in the NME made the news. Stuff that happened in the magazines I worked for in Australia made the news. The entire TV and radio industry pretty well fed on print. It was extraordinary. It's nothing like that now. The internet has completely changed everything. They are, they've completely lost the cultural weight they used to carry. A, a friend of mine who was a major editor in London uh, actually said that in a way that print journalists are now like the coachman at the turn of the 19th, the 20th century, you know, it's like, oh my God, you know, people are beginning to drive cars. And it's a little bit like that now. So people are podcasting now and doing all sorts of things. But um, it, it was an amazing time in its way and lots of fun. I mean, I had a ball, um, but I didn't actually recognize that the contempt that I had for femininity that had been inculcated in me by the wider culture, by my father, who was an, who was an extremely patriarchal male, Italian, Northern Italian, mm -hmm. and um, super patriarchal. And I was the favorite and mm -hmm. I was the smart one. And I was, I was basically, you know, he's like, I remember I grew up hearing him say, you can do anything. You can be prime minister if you want. And I'm like, yeah, I wouldn't be prime minister. But the understanding was that I wasn't permitted to have a life. That wasn't what mattered. What mattered was achievement. Mm -hmm. And it was a very masculine mindset. And it was only when I gave birth I'd only been pregnant once, by the way. <laughs> I hadn't even fallen pregnant. I was so weird. All my girlfriends were, had either fallen pregnant or had so termination. So what year, what year was your daughter born? 2005. And how old, are you, how old were you at this time? 39, sorry, okay. going back, yeah. Okay. I'm like so that, that's quite actually um, an unusual, unusually late pregnancy to go successfully, right? It was perfect. I, I, look, to, to be quite frank, um, I had seen a psychic in my 20s and he said, your mind is so strong that you will not fall pregnant until you are ready and you will fall pregnant once. And I'm like, ha, huh, sure. I had a zillion accidents at the peak of my fertility, a zillion. I was engaged, condoms breaking left, right and center, this, that. Nothing ever happened. I had a couple of maybe scares, nothing. They turned out to be nothing. I met my husband-to-be and I said, look, why don't we try to have a child? I, am, I think I'm infertile. I've never fallen pregnant. I've had a million accidents. It's never happened. I don't think I can, but we, you know, why don't we try? And so we did. And I was pregnant within a fortnight, mm -hmm. a fortnight. And everything was perfect. So, but I had a very confusing time during the pregnancy. It was a time of just enormous looking back. I was very effectively flattened. And what I mean by that is that I didn't seem to have a normal response. And in fact, when I told the doctor that I was pregnant, she looking at my face, she said, um, do you want a termination? And I said, mm, no. <laughs> and she was really surprised because there was a, a disconnection between my reaction and the information I was giving her because it was like, hey, we're really happy, the baby was planned. And yet my expression was flat. I just felt so flat for most of the pregnancy. I think in retrospect, it was a combination of hormones. And also I was adjusting to the idea of being female because the strangest thing when I fell pregnant, when I saw the test, was thinking that I could. It was like a man suddenly thinking, oh, wow, well, I can be pregnant because I've never seen myself as a woman before, not really. 
And so there was a massive paradigm shift. It's like, hang on a minute, I'm not a man. Well, do you understand what I mean by that? It's, I mean, I didn't think I was a man, like a, a trans man, but I, I, like I, I liked my body, but mentally I felt very masculine. And, um, and there was this massive, massive shift and everything changed when my daughter was born, everything. As I wrote in Mama, it was like a, a crevasse had opened and my old self fell into it, never to be seen again. And this entirely new person was born. And it wasn't my daughter, it was me. So when did you get the idea to turn all of this into a book? Um, it began then. Yeah, I began after her, I, when I first saw her, she was actually she had cyanosis. She was blue. She was oxygen deprived. And I was on all fours and they said, look at your daughter. Because I, I once again, I had this really strange response, which people were finding odd, that I was kind of flat. I wasn't reacting in a normal way. And they pushed her under me and they said, this is your daughter. And I looked at her and I didn't feel anything. And I said, is it dead? Because she was blue. And they went, oh my God, oxygen. So they quickly gave her oxygen. And then they put it back under me and she, her little face, she had this tiny little orange face. And she went, she was slightly jaundiced as well. And she went, meh, meh. and the minute I heard her voice, it was, it was extraordinary. It was um, just love. It was like someone had opened a door or a dam, or it was just that, that delineated, that defined. Bam! It was this insane passion for this tiny little creature, not on seeing her, but on hearing her. And from that moment onwards, I was enraptured with this baby. And I just wanted to be near her and hold her all the time. It was the strangest thing in all the world. I've never experienced anything like it. Um, and I remember I was so impassioned in the maternity ward. We were there for a week because she was jaundiced. And there was another mother next to me. I was, there was another woman in the, in the room and she was in shock after her cesarean. And I remember her husband used to come and visit her and all they would do is watch television. Well, the husband did, he'd put on the sport, I could hear it, the baby would be screaming. When the husband would go, I would actually see this woman sitting there in an ex with an expression of almost catatonic shock as this baby was screaming in the cot beside her and she would just stare at the wall. And all of these experiences were beginning to register the disconnection between women and children, the disconnection between men and the women who born their children, the disconnection between the wider culture and the family. And this began percolating in my mind. Meanwhile, I was kind of the opposite. I just wanted to be with her all the time. She was in a cot. I would pull her out of the cot. I'd put her in my bed. The midwife would come in and say, you can't do that. The hospital cannot be legally liable. I said, I'm not expecting you to be. And she said, but you can't do that. You've got to put the baby in the cot. I said, I'm breastfeeding. I wasn't. <laughs> every three, I mean, every single time this woman walked in, it was like, I'm breastfeeding. And I mean, I was breastfeeding, but not all day long. I just refused to be parted from my child. And in retrospect, I'm so glad I, I did. Um, and I was just with her all the time. And co-sleeping, which was something I'd never planned to do. I'd bought a cot. The whole thing was just instinctive. I'd actually bought everything in preparation for the conventional kind of mothering experience, which is I had about 20 pacifiers. I had the cot. I had a, we never used the cot. 
never used a single pacifier, never used the bottles, other than I think once when we tried. It was ridiculous. I mean, I followed my, my heart and I'm very glad I did. And that's when I started, after a little while, I started writing about it. And that book finally came out, Mama, Love, yep. Motherhood and Revolution. Yeah. 2015. Um, it is, I think, Martin and, what is it, Linter Press? Linter and Martin. Linter and Martin Press. Yeah. And I just finished this book. Yeah. And it's about a subject which is dear to me. Uh, me and my wife made a mother, uh, made a film about motherhood 10 years ago called Medea Legacy. Called and what, sorry? The Medea Legacy. Okay. And um, I've just written a book on love, uh, which is now called Post-Socratic Dialogues Love, but we're changing the title to Love Before COVID, but a third of that book is about motherhood too. Okay. Um, so this is something I've been thinking about and writing about uh, and making films about for years and years and years. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I really loved about your book, there's a couple of things, um, is the writing is really, really skillful and kind of luscious. Thank it's you. like cake almost. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, so that, that, that's the first thing that's really interesting about it. The second thing that I really like about it, which in some ways is like my latest book, it's in dialogue form. So it's yeah, it, part of it. Talking yeah. to other people. I did that deliberately. Mm -hmm. because I wanted mothers are busy fathers are busy with particularly with younger children and I should point out that as you've observed this isn't really a how-to book in terms of practical issues like how to change a nappy or anything it's more about the maternal paradigm or the parental paradigm mm -hmm. and I put the interviews I did in dialogue format because people are busy and I didn't, I knew, I just wanted a book that a, a parent, particularly mothers really, but a parent could pick up and read whatever interested them whenever they had time. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of every chapter, there was kind of reminder points which they could rip out and just stick on the fridge if they wanted to. It's just whatever area had particular resonance for those parents. Mm -hmm. But that's why I did it, yeah. The new book's very different. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a sequel coming out. Uh, am I yes. correct in saying that that's a sequel? Yes. Yes. Um, yes and no. Yes, in that it is a sequel. And I extrapolate, I unpack a number of themes, but this, this one is not an easy book. This is Apple Sex drugs, motherhood, and the recovery of the feminine. And unlike Mama, Love, Motherhood, and Revolution, the one you have, it's Mama was a lot friendlier in format. Apple is tough. So is this more Apple's, like spicy salsa instead of cake? Uh, no, it's not like spicy sal salsa. It's more like, um, mm, how would I describe it? Interesting. I don't think it's comestible. I think if um, if I were to use a different metaphor, I would say Mama is more like a picnic on the grass mm -hmm. um, with comestibles available, whereas Apple is actually probably a um, a very serious forum <laughs> there's a lot of interesting conversations going on it's quite hard go heavy going in part whereas okay. mama is more accessible yeah well when you come out with the second book it'd be interesting to have you on again because i'd like to ah, hear the first and love second to. Book. yes okay yeah but go on you, you were saying i'm interested in your book and your film and all this stuff as well so let's talk about that as um well the thing i was interested in also about your book is because it's in dialogue form and this mm. is the issue i have with my book because it's also written in dialogues it's sometimes not clear whether you agree with the person speaking or whether you're a bit ambivalent about what they're saying or whether you're wholeheartedly on board with them it sounds like you like everybody you speak to but at moments in the book i'm always a little bit like well does she agree with that person or does she think that person is taking things a bit too far 
So I wanted to ask you, do you agree with all of what is said by the interviewees or, or do you have some? No, right of course not. Some people I do. Gabor Mate, it's hard not to fall in love with Gabor. Mm -hmm. He, um, the wisdom, the depth, the, the beauty, the spiritual beauty of the man is just ridiculous. I mean, he's ridiculously beautiful you know as a human being others in the book i didn't agree with all the way um but they were in the book for a reason you know sheila kitzinger late yeah. sheila kitzinger i didn't agree with all the way uh sheila is was amazing an extraordinary pioneer an amazing woman who did amazing work but she was one of these feminists for whom women could do no wrong right and that's just nonsense that's just nonsense women can be monsters i i have there is one woman in my life who is literally the most astonishing sociopath i've ever even heard of i mean just insane this woman's nuts and evil I mean, what we understand to be evil. I don't. I don't believe in evil as a as a force per se, like a religious concept. Um, but a destructive, crazy person. And sure, there are a lot of reasons for that. But there are a lot of reasons why men become crazy sociopaths too. Whereas Sheila Kissinger was like, "Oh, she's a woman. You know, she may be a sociopath, but she's a woman." And whereas men, when they're sociopaths, men are toxic, men are the devil, men are Satan. And it's like, well, no, that's actually not how it works, Sheila. She, I found that quite stupid, to be honest, uh, mm -hmm. the way you can kind of segregate um, in that fashion. And men are always, when a man's bad, he's terrible. He's, he's just rubbish. Whereas when a woman's bad, it's because of men. I mean, you could just as easily say when a man is bad, it's because of his mother. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's just ridiculous. It's like when people are bad, there are problems. Mm -hmm. um, and so Sheila, I didn't agree with all the time. Although some of the work she did was sublime right. in the area of breastfeeding and the area of treating the mother, you know, blah, blah, blah. It was just beautiful, world-changing work. But as I said, on this other hand, we have this, you know, women are perfect, women are great, men are bastards, men are bastards. And, and it's just rubbish. I think that's a very dangerous perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, there were probably a couple of others I didn't agree with completely, but they were there for a reason because in part they had done amazing work or they were contributing something very significant. Okay. Um, yeah. So if we abstract from all of those conversations, what you actually think, and there's some ambivalence about what you do think in a way, which is interesting. Um, what would you say is the book's philosophy of motherhood? In short, it's a book about intimacy. It's an examination. It's a look at how intimacy is created, how the capacity for intimacy is created, how the culture intercepts inter intimacy in the guise of economics or functioning or whatever you want to call it, um, how intimacy can be reinstated on a familial and cultural level. Um, it's about intimacy. It's an exploration of intimacy. And it wasn't so much a definitive work in that I was literally exploring it myself and exploring it. I wanted the reader to ask themselves questions. My aim with Mama, Love, Motherhood and Revolution was to get women to pause and men to pause and to say, hang on a minute, what am I doing to intercept intimacy in my life? Why am I not happy? Why is my child acting? You know, all these different, all these questions that we have without answers and to start actually taking it back to the issue of intimacy. Because, you know, we are hairless apes and without intimacy, we are as nothing. 
you know, love is this is the great sustaining force of humanity. And without love, we implode on every level. And I wanted to get people to start addressing that. The new book I've written, Apple, is quite conclusive. That, you know, Mama in some ways was the question, Apple is the answer. Okay. I, I find that if that's probably the best way of putting it. That's just literally occurred to me right now. But with Mama, I was formulating questions. I was saying, hang on a minute. So we can pull this in and we can pull that in and we can look at this and how do we change it? What do we do? It boils down to the idea of capacity economically, capacity in a neurobiological sense and capacity culturally for intimacy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, so it sounds like the core concepts the book is dealing with are love and intimacy. Right? Yes, absolutely, yes. So let's talk a bit about those. What do you think love is? Oh, lovely question. Um, hmm. How would I define love? What, what kind of love are we talking about here? We're talking about romantic, platonic, maternal, paternal. Okay, so there are different kinds. There's varieties of love, right? Yes, of course. Of Is course. there any one thing they all have in common? Truly, true love. Mm -hmm. Sacrifice. The concept of sacrifice. So I sacrifice, think that's what. Okay. Yeah, it's not the only thing they have in common, but if I were to think of one element that all kinds of love have in common i'm thinking very quickly it would be sacrifice it would be the idea of um but when i say sacrifice it's also an effortless sacrifice where you want to where you will willingly sacrifice for example your body your time your you know also money everything to raise a child you know, children are these massive expenditures of energy mm -hmm. and money and for women, their beauty, you know, and that may sound like a trivial thing, but it's really not for women in this culture where is beauty is at such a premium. Is it important to be beautiful? In this culture? Are you kidding me? Yeah. For some, what do you think? Have you looked around at magazines? Have you looked around at television? Have you looked around at weight loss programs and makeup, the multi-billion dollar makeup industry, the hair industry. I think looking at that, I think we can assume that beauty is at a premium in this culture for women. Yes, absolutely. Is, is that absolutely. a, do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? Oh, interesting question. Um, to the extent that we do it, it's self-destructive. Mm -hmm. um, however, having said that, I think that this current political disregard of beauty is equally destructive because beauty is one of the great joys of life. And I don't just mean in terms of human appearance, I mean in terms of the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, who doesn't love looking at the moonlit ocean or to receive flowers or to see mm -hmm. a baby's face. So, you know, a beauty is important. And we have come culturally to this point now where we address beauty as irrelevant, as anti-feminist, as all this shit, it's rubbish. Um, I think when beauty becomes a problem is when it becomes the dominant value. Mm -hmm. Then it's a problem. Beauty as the dominant value is a massive issue. However, beauty as part of life is one of life's joys, you know? Okay. So, yeah, so, yeah. What would you say to somebody who says that um, beauty is one of life's joys? Yes. But it, it's, a, it's not a good joy to value in human beings because it has nothing to do with who human beings are. So for instance, if you have two, for instance, people who are equally good in lots of different ways, 
Yes. But one of them is far more beautiful than the other. That's mm -hmm. not relevant in any way to how you should value both of those people or treat them. I disagree. If, if they're up for a modeling contract, it is relevant. <laughs> it depends the con on the context. Yeah. I mean, if you're looking at two equally talented, gifted nurses, then it's completely irrelevant. Then it has nothing yeah. to do with anything. But if you're looking at, you know, a different context, it, it depends on the context. I think beauty, like I've known a lot of beautiful women because mm -hmm. I'm from, I've also worked in magazines with models and you, I mean, these astonishing creatures, you know, six feet tall, literally perfect, literally, the, when I say perfect, I mean symmetrical, right? Mm -hmm. Because most of us have asymmetrical faces. I certainly do. I have a crooked nose, the rest of it. But these, these creatures, male and female, are just celestial in their beauty. And I think that's a gift too you know and it's what some people do very well you know the rest of us that's not our superpower that's why i'm a writer <laughs> so, I, mean, I, know. I would just say to the argument um uh, that there should yeah. be no models because we shouldn't value people for looking a certain way because they don't for the most part earn that it just happens and then when it goes away and they get wrinkles we suddenly start valuing them less and that's not good either well, I think the world is changing in this respect. What you are saying is correct, but I think what we what is going on at the moment is a valuing, um, like they're calling it like the gray evolution and all this sort of stuff. It's it's mm -hmm. like um, you we are beginning to value different kinds of beauty. What we are doing is we are expanding our definition of beauty, which was very necessary because the whole evolution of beauty as an ideal is actually economic, mm -hmm. which is hilarious. And most people are unaware of, you are probably fully aware of that. Um, but, you know, when, for example, you look at cultures, when things are going very badly, the, the heavier build is valued in a woman. Mm -hmm. um, so you get buxom or bottomy women who are considered beautiful. And in times of relative wealth, the thinner, the, you know, you basically look at the opposite of what's happening economically as an ideal to move towards. So beauty by any stretch is not, it's a movable feast. You know, um, something that was considered beautiful in the 19th century is not considered beautiful now. So beauty in itself is, is changes all the time. What I was referring to, I suppose, more was symmetry, which has pretty well always been considered beautiful. Symmetry is considered beautiful. You know, these people who are just symmetrical from almost every angle. Um, mm -hmm. And what you were saying is, well, in that case, should symmetry be, be valued above asymmetry? And it's not actually a choice, I don't think. It's just something that the eye is drawn to symmetry. Mm -hmm. There is something in the human eye that's drawn to symmetry in um, environment, in we are just drawn, I don't know, I haven't studied it, I don't know why the human eye prefers symmetry. Mm -hmm. All the rest is economically and culturally based, you know, what we find beautiful. Mm -hmm. So that's all movable, but the symmetrical thing isn't, and I can't answer that because I haven't studied it, I don't know. Okay, what would you say to somebody who says, it's fine to value symmetry, let's say, if you're deciding yes. who to have sex with or who to get in a relationship with, because that's the only yeah. sort of person that can arouse you. Yeah. But outside of that, in every other area of culture, we should ignore it because it's shallow. I would, this is a very interesting debate, this whole concept of shallow, um, also, the concept of only sexuality being aligned with beauty, because I don't find that has anything to do with my sexuality. Beauty has never been the drive. Well, no, what I call beautiful, other people don't. And I have friends and even my daughter often laugh at my choices on a personal level because no one else finds them beautiful. But I do because I see something in it and it transforms them for me. So I'm looking at like, a, I don't go for symmetry, that is, is what I'm trying to say. Symmetry is not what 
floats my boat sexually. I, I go for, mm. uh, I like expansiveness, emotional expansiveness. I, I like wildness. And um, that is what gets me going on a personal level. But in terms of beauty being without value, Mm-hmm. In, on a human level, my argument would be, I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true. It's, it's as I said, it's not what floats my boat. Mm-hmm. The, some of my partners have just had my friends going, what, what are you doing? You know, what choice have you made? But um in terms of the wider application of beauty and its value and the concept of shallowness in relation to beauty, I don't think that beauty is shallow per se. I don't think it's the only thing either. And I don't think it's the most important thing. But to say that it is entirely without value on the basis of some democratic insistence that everything must be entirely equal and that any kind of divergence from a baseline equality is almost a perversion. I disagree with. Okay. So here's an interesting question that brings it back to motherhood. Mm. Suppose you had instead of Bethesda, you had twins. Bethesda. Bethesda. Sorry, you had you had twins. Um, sorry. <laughs> no, sorry, I always pronounce that wrong. Bethesda. Okay. Well, you're you're American, and in America, Bethesda's everywhere. It's the English you never get uh, Bethesda right. I've lived in, in England since uh, 2005, and this is coming from England. So I'm okay. a British citizen. Oh, you are originally? Okay. Yes. Uh, not originally, okay. but I became one in 2017. I haven't lived in America since 2004. So I've been British for 15 or 16 years. That's why you make that mistake. In England, everyone goes Bethsida, and it's like, no. Whereas the Americans always understand that because you have Bethesda, Maryland, and all the hospitals are called Bethesda. Oh, right. and- yeah, the, I'm from LA, so I never was around those areas. <laughs> but the presiding angel of the Civil War was Bethesda. Yeah, know, yeah, so. probably. Um, yeah. So anyway, so, so anyway, yes. You had two. You had a, a twins instead of one child. So suppose you had your actual daughter. Yeah. And you had another child with her. Yes. That compared to your daughter, was very very unattractive by the standards of society. And suppose you noticed that as they were growing up, your daughter had all these opportunities and got all this positive attention and had all these choices when it came to boyfriends or girlfriends that your other child did not. How would you talk about that to the other child if they said, mommy, why does- Okay, first of all, my daughter, when she was born, was Mm -hmm. orange with a square head. She was virtually hairless for a year and a half. <laughs> I remember that on we had boxes of uh, nappies, diapers, mm-hmm. and on the boxes, there were these gorgeous little blonde girl babies, you know, chubby, angelic, cherubic, big blue eyes, ringlets, just, you know, the classic chocolate box baby. And I'd be changing her nappy and I'd look up from my little orange square headed baby at this amazingly beautiful blonde baby. And you know what I thought? What? I thought, oh my God, if only that blonde baby were as divine as my little orange special jelly bean baby. (laughs) I really did. I could actually show you pictures of Bethesda when she was born. She was not uh aesthetically pleasing on pretty much any level really she was she became very cute within probably a couple of years but she was not she was not born pretty if you know what i mean and um so aesthetics had nothing to do with it i literally thought she was the most gorgeous child in the world even though aesthetically i could see that for example this blonde chubby cheek blue eyed baby was aesthetically by our cultural norms prettier okay on every level but Mm -hmm. to me I wouldn't have traded my little square-headed orange baby for the world you know because she was my baby and that's what I mean so I was 
I was never pretty at school. My best friend was the beautiful one. I was the smart one and mm. she was gorgeous. She had um, long electric orange hair and green eyes and she was tall, you know, very, very beautiful girl. Mm -hmm. And I always felt like her dowdy cousin. But what I loved was the radiance of her loveliness. And that wasn't, the, by the way, the only thing she had going for it. She was also really funny. We used to laugh together all the time. But I basked in it. And I was actually never envious. I loved it. And mm. I never felt pretty, ever, until um, a wonderful boyfriend I had when I was 20. And he was the first person who ever made me feel pretty. So mm. I always felt like the ugly duckling. So it wasn't, you know, in terms of, but what I had and what I saw and what I would tell my, my un conventionally unattracted twin child, <laughs> it's, it's like, dude, looks don't actually get you very far unless you're an actress or a model in the world, the thing that actually gets in my experience is personality and warmth and intelligence. And I've some look with the men I've known who've been the most astonishingly successful womanizers. And I'm thinking of three men in particular. And these guys were, as they say in England, pullers. They could pull anybody you know, no matter how successful beautiful long-legged rich whatever these guys they're like almost you know they're weapons of war you put them in a room and they will draw the most beautiful women to them all three um borderline ugly by cultural norms these were not this was not chris hemsworth guys who were oh, one of them one of them was tall and reasonably well built Mm -hmm. but the face wasn't much you know um and yet they could pull why because they were sexy because they had personality because they were hilarious because they were offbeat all of them and they were amazingly compelling they were amazingly compelling men um mm -hmm. and i just laugh every time i see them operate because it's like you know you sit there and you just think wow this literally works with women you know um and they're not beautiful at all and mm -hmm. i've seen similar things with women not to the same degree because beauty is more important culturally for mm -hmm. women but i you know some women i've known who've been incredibly compelling to men are not beautiful they are compelling they have the x factor you know so I, I kind of disagree with what you're saying, this assumption that someone with beauty is automatically going to have all these advantages. I've seen the opposite. I've seen that very beautiful people who perhaps aren't very bright mm -hmm. actually get treated like shit. I've seen this in particular with women where I'm thinking of three, once again, three women in particular, one of whom was a well-known model and the others were just beautiful women and they were treated I, I like so badly I cannot begin to tell you by men because what a guy guys would target them and they would use them as a means of enhancing their own status it's like look I can pull this bird she's so gorgeous and now I'm going to treat her like rubbish that's how amazing I am by just and I was actually talking to a very successful producer recently he's quoted in Apple and one of the things he said was and I'm paraphrasing here um part of the power of music the music industry as a man is by seeing just how much young pussy you can fuck and dump beautiful young pussy you can fuck and dump so there is this urban myth that beautiful people have everything laid out for them and in some respects if they're in the right industry that is the case in others they actually have the opposite where they get exploited where they get treated like shit where they get 
hurt deliberately because they're beautiful, um, where they're used as objects, where they are courted as, as kind of handbags, as status objects, as one would buy a car. And I don't think that's an advantage. I actually think that the beauty is by no means the greatest power on this planet. I think intelligence is, you know, and it's a myth. It's an absolute myth that beauty gets you everywhere. You know, sure, a beautiful model may earn a lot of money, but so does a, a banker who lies, <laughs> you know, and so does, you know, so it, it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant because when you see the inside, I, I know stories that I can't talk about with world figures who are very beautiful people mm -hmm. and their personal lives are not are awful. The, the things that have happened to them are awful, particularly as young women where they are literally preyed on. Awful. Hmm. So I would disagree with you on almost every account there. I don't think that whilst beauty may attract attention, mm -hmm. it is no guarantee of anything beyond that. And I think it's actually detrimental. But whether it has value, I absolutely believe it does. Okay. So, yeah. So that's what I would say to the twin. I would say, you know, work hard, study, and have enjoy yourself and evolve a personality because it's the, the less attractive kids who work on their personality and usually get a big personality. And they're the ones who actually do very well in life because emotional literacy is the greatest marker of success in our culture. Mm -hmm. um, not beauty. You know, okay. there are plenty of beautiful prostitutes. I don't know. I actually, I was writing a piece about prostitution and I did some research online looking at the escort companies, agencies online. These girls, I mean, astonishing. They look like models, half of them. And it's like, what are you doing? You're working as prostitutes? It's like, you know, mind fuck. Um, so yeah, beauty doesn't get you very far by itself. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, I think some of them might take but, offense at that and they might think that their careers are actually quite powerful and important expressions of female. Wow. Issues. Okay. This is an entirely different conversation. Yeah. I write about this in my book. I explain it very, very carefully, mm -hmm. um, in terms of sex work, it is literally an evolution of slavery. Mm -hmm. It involves a complete disconnection of um, mind and body. It involves the commercializing of sexuality, which is the, an expression of feeling. So it involves a radically important disconnect between feeling and intellect. Mm -hmm. Many levels to this discussion. Many so is it, is it, in your view, anti-intimacy to be a sex worker? <laughs> Yeah, yes. Anti-intimacy with the self, you know, with this idea that you use yourself as a kind of market stall. Um, there are so many, this is, this is a very, very, this is a multi-layered complex discussion, which would be a show in itself. Um, this is not something that can be summed up in a second. And I'm not coming from the uh, perspective of, oh, sex work is bad, you know, it's not that they're bad. It's not a matter of they're bad. It's a matter of addressing them as fractured in terms of intimacy, absolutely fractured. And it's a cultural construct. It's a byproduct of the patriarchal ideology. Um, it's, it's modern slavery. And we think that just because they're in charge of their own slavery, it makes a difference. It's, it's like, what? No, not really. If we were actually in a culture where femininity were respected and where people were respected, sex work would not exist. Okay. So yeah. this brings us to the second core concept of mama, which is intimacy. Yes. yes. What do you think intimacy is? Closeness. But genuine closeness where you show your true self to somebody rather than you know, it's like, it's like we were talking about, you can have sex without intimacy. That's prostitution. Mm -hmm. um, you can have sex without intimacy and it's not prostitution. It, it's, 
intimacy is what we live for. And it comes in a million different forms. It's not as simple as romantic intimacy. It can be, you know, the intimacy of a nurse and a patient. It can be the mother and the child. It can be lovers. It can be stepfather and stepchild. It can, you know, there, there are a million different kinds of intimacy. The, but it involves a consciousness of exchange. I think that's the premise. There is actually a consciousness of spiritual exchange. Once again, I don't use the word spiritual in a religious sense. I'm not religious. Um, anything. I'm sort of more Buddhist than anything, but I'm not even Buddhist because I disagree with certain things. I have many Buddhist, Buddhist friends. Yeah, I'm semi. I would describe myself as semi Buddhist rather than. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of. Uh, I have a, a number of problems with the Buddhist ideology. But, um, but in other respects, I think they're probably the closest to wisdom. Mm -hmm. Christianity gets some things right, and then it just goes whack in the uh, just obscenely wrong direction. Judaism the same, Islam the same, and then they go in the wrong direction. Then they, they just have these kernels of wisdom and beauty, and then they wreck it with all this other stuff. Whereas Buddhism has more wisdom in my experience than others I've read about. Even so, I disagree with them fanatically on the topic of anger, but we won't go into that now. They're okay. so wrong in, in terms of the angry thing. But back to intimacy, um, it's the reason we live. Mm -hmm. It's what makes life feel worthwhile. It's what makes a human being feel worthwhile without intimacy we self-destruct without intimacy a 12 year old child tries to overdose without intimacy a 17 year old girl tries to slash her wrists you know without intimacy a 32 year old man pulls a bag over his head and gasses himself in a car which is what my brother did mm -hmm. And that's what happens when we have no intimacy. When you see homeless people on the streets, you are looking at children who didn't have intimacy. And that's what they are. Every time I pass them, it breaks my heart. Okay. No, it's all because, right. Yeah, it's, it's, I see it on so many levels. Just when, a human being has no intimacy. They lose the will to live. They literally lose the will to live. And they don't want to live anymore. So this is interesting. So you, you equate intimacy with closeness to other humans, right? Um, in a weird way, I think you can also kind of have an element of intimacy with animals. Okay, other creatures, maybe? Yes, other creatures, but it's not the same. I mean, it's not as... Uh, I think it can be very useful for some people. I think animals can really, really be restorative for a lot of people. I think the role of animals in terms of love is much underplayed. Um, but without some connection, without a sense of being seen, um, on the deepest level by another being, why would you want to live? You would feel like you don't exist. What would you say to people who say they don't really like intimacy because for them, it's a restriction on their freedom, their autonomy, their ability to not feel tied down to others. Um, and, and they- I love this. Kind I of love a, this so much. I, feel I deal with that. In, I deal with this in my upcoming book. I'm not going to talk about it now. Um, okay. It's big, all I will say is this: that what you're saying is fascinating, and it's very, very much the vogue at the moment because we are. I know some people like this personally who don't seem to like. I, I do too. I actually do too. I've had these discussions. I find them hilarious. One of my one of my dearest friends is is a polygamist. And um, I adore this guy. He's hysterical. 
very clever in his way, you know, um, but he is someone who, because of the most astonishing and sustained childhood trauma, intimacy to him is so threatening, so unbearable. The idea of being seen in all his pain and trauma is literally intolerable for him. Mm -hmm. But he's a very dysfunctional unit. You know, he's an extremely dysfunctional man on almost every level other than professionally. And mm -hmm. he, the fact that he's been able to survive this long, given what happened to him, mm -hmm. is quite astonishing. And I admire him for it, for having the, the resourcefulness and the strength to continue. But he really doesn't have the capacity to be seen he he can't when you reach a certain point with this guy he cannot be seen any further and he's like a wounded dog he starts to bite you know don't get close to me i'm in pain so he can only tolerate what i would call you know simulacra of intimacy where it's the intimacy you have when you're not really having intimacy, but it's all he can literally deal with. So the people you're talking about rationalize it with an ideology, but the fact is their capacity is seriously impaired because of certain reasons I go into in the new book. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Do you, do you worry that this critique of the, the non-intimate person or the anti-intimate person can be read by some people as intolerance and they'll say well no we need to be uh... no, absolutely not because when you when you read i can't you see i want to say certain things but i wanted to come out with the book that's the only reason i'm not engaging on this level because okay. um it is in the new book it is and it explains things anybody who could possibly it, it's literally inarguable and it's not a matter of intolerance when you read the explanation which is very very intricate and very detailed um you'll you'll get you'll understand it's literally when you get to the end it's literally inarguable it's an inarguable argument it's not it's 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 just based on certain things i'm not going to talk about right now okay. I, I wish i could it's it's frustrating but we should stick to mama because we're moving into apple okay here. all right yeah. so going back to mama so the two yeah mama, core this, concepts. This, yeah apple is about this stuff yeah, yeah. But, but mama is not yeah so the two core concepts in mama are love and intimacy yes um and love and intimacy are how you describe the relationship or what grounds the relationship between the mother and the child um, permanently, but particularly manifested in quite intense behaviors in like the first five years, right? Yes, absolutely, yes. The first three in particular, yeah. Okay, so this um, book is advocating, or maybe it's not advocating, if it's not, you yeah. can correct me, but it seems to me like it's advocating a style of parenting yes. called attachment parenting. Is that yes, correct? yes, absolutely correct. And as I pointed out before, I didn't even know what attachment parenting was when I became an attachment parent. So I didn't go into this thinking, oh, you know, I'm a granola crunching attachment parent. It wasn't like that. I didn't even know what I was doing. I was literally the only person I knew, knew who was doing this. It was like I was a freak. And I was it, out of the large group of mothers who came together when our babies were born, the hospital, which is actually an excellent idea. After birth, they give you this mother's group to go to in your area where all these other women who had babies at your age meet. I was the only one. So mm -hmm. it wasn't a cultural thing. It wasn't something I'd read about. It wasn't something I'd experienced with my own parents. It wasn't something anybody I knew had done. And even homeschooling, I ended up homeschooling my daughter later. That was just not on the radar. I'd never even heard of anyone doing that. So I was particularly not someone like me who was this like super career animal it was freakish you know and even now when you look at a lot of homeschoolers you're looking at hippies and you're looking at earth people and sort of 
these sorts of people, and I was not that person is what I'm, I, I guess I'm saying, you know, I'd been this kind of chain smoking, designer, label wearing sort of career person. I wasn't someone who was, you know, in the farmyard with goats, you know, holding my baby's hand. And I kind of turned into that. <laughs> <laughs> not with the goat although I did and take the book it beautifully describes how you did transform yeah yeah well it wasn't it was complete transformation but it was the point I'm making is it was instinctive mm -hmm. so the idea of attachment parenting as a formal movement no um what I'm advocating is attachment and attachment as I make clear in the book is a matter of degree, depending on the individual. You mm -hmm. might have a single mother who has no option but to go out and work. You know, who else is gonna pay the bills? You know, they're not gonna fall out of the sky. Money's not gonna fall out of the sky. So what I talk about in the book is adapting your life to attachment um, in whatever way you can, in whatever way suits your lifestyle. Um, be, and also there's the capacity, as I mentioned before, not everyone has it. Some people have an almost bottomless capacity for attachment. They can attach completely without problems. Other people have anxious attachment because of their own childhood. So they're very nervous around bonding. Other people avoid attachment. They're the people you were referring to. If you look at the the different attachment styles that have been studied, the people, the group you're referring to are avoidance, the avoidant attachment people, because they've had experiences where they either have had no early experience of true attachment, or they've had a very traumatic experience of early attachment. So they, it's too scary. So Mama was written to kind of get people to question the level of attachment in their lives and adapt to the degree, even if it's only a 5% change, that's huge. If you can just, if that book, and I've had lots of women write to me, by the way, but if that book can get one mother to stop looking at her iPhone when she's pushing her baby in her pram, it succeeded. Mm -hmm. You see so what I mean? I it's like degrees. Yeah. Well, maybe we should talk a bit about what exactly is attachment in the context of being a mother for you? Well, it's not just for me. If you look at attachment theory um, and what you do, attachment is basically you have this completely helpless little creature, right? And the creature isn't really even able to individuate from you. You are it, you are a unit. They call it the, the fourth trimester, the first three months of life. They call it the fourth trimester for that reason, because the baby doesn't even know it's not you. So the minute you're not there when it has a need or you're not able to meet its need, fractures start occurring in its ability to feel, to have its needs met. And um, there's a sense of not being valued. And this isn't even an intellectual sense, we're talking on the deepest emotional level of not being valuable enough to warrant nurturance. So attachment is that nurturance, it doesn't mean perfection, it doesn't mean you don't fuck up. It doesn't mean, you know, you're some kind of you know, I've had people say to me, oh, well, it's easy for you because you were obviously rich and, you know, you I wasn't. We I took a massive cut in income to become a mother. We were so poor. It was crazy. Um, we didn't even own our own house. We didn't have anything. We just had this little rented flat. It's, it's just a myth. I've honestly had letters written to newspapers. Oh, it's fine for her. She's obviously married to a lawyer. It's like, no, I actually was making, I was the breadwinner at the beginning. And um, this is all a myth. It's all rubbish. We were dirt poor, dirt poor. Um, but we made it work. Because, as I said before, priorities, it's a matter of establishing what your priorities are. I didn't give a fuck about having 
uh, a beautiful house or an expensive car or this or that or the other. My value system was turned on its head and that stuff didn't mean anything to me anymore. It really didn't. It was like it overnight, as I said, when I heard her voice, my world was turned upside down. The things that had been important to me meant nothing. And um, what mattered was her and my husband, whom I adored, absolutely adored. And it was this passion and it was the happiest, you know, I, I'd never been so happy. And so I really worked hard on um, loving her so she would always have this core understanding of what it is to be loved. And people who attempt suicide, like us, are people who's, who don't have that, not, not at core. You can work on it, you can kind of patch it up, you can kind of improve and practice self-love and put out the right energy and attract this and do that, and you make it work for you. But at core, there's a sense. Um, I, a friend of mine is someone who has a lot of problems with addiction. Mm -hmm. And this person said to me, nobody cares. And I said, well, I do. Yeah. And it's what we're talking about before, the sense of conviction. You see, my daughter, no matter what will ever happen to her, and I am, as I said before, this idea that I'm some kind of perfect mother is just ludicrous. I won't go into that, but it's ludicrous. But the one thing I've done is that she has never felt unloved, ever. Mm -hmm. I have yelled. <laughs> I have been horrible on occasion because of stress. I've, all sorts of things have happened. But she has never felt unloved by me okay and there is no greater gift you can give to a child than making that child feel loved yep. what would you say to some of your critics who have said that um when you define attachment parenting so kind of amorphously where it's not about specific rules and things you have to do it's just kind of having a certain mindset um they would say well Every mom has this mindset, unless she's an extraordinarily dysfunctional, abusive mother. But this is just no, what that's people not ordinarily true. do. What would you say bullshit. to that? Bullshit. I'd say that's bullshit. Having hung out with innumerable mothers, that is a myth. Once again, it's this cultural myth that all mothers do their best, that all mothers love their children. It's absolute bullshit. What planet are these? What kind of Enid Blyton planet are these people living on? I mean, I know women who literally hire nannies to keep their children at a distance. Um, women who hire nannies from the kid, from the time the kids are born, who don't even stay up at night with the children because they need to sleep so they can look good. I mean, it's rubbish. It's, it's a myth. The capacity for love has been very damaged and um, it's bullshit. It's bullshit that every woman loves her child. It's bullshit that every woman does her best. Some women do. Others don't for any number of reasons. I'm, I, I'm thinking of uh, a couple of women in particular who are actually lovely women. These were not bad human beings. These, these women were not sociopaths. They were terrible mothers because they had no idea how to be a mother. And mothering is a skill. It's a love-based skill. And if you have the love you can kind of model along in every other area. There are, as you say, it's not so much rules. I don't like this whole concept of rules. It's not, you know, it's not a, an engineering course, but it, I think there are guidelines if you want to increase the degree of intimacy. That's a better way of putting it. If you are someone who's there going, how can I be more attached to my child? Or there are attachment ruptures with my child. How can I facilitate attachment? Then I can say, aha, there are certain guidelines. Look, breastfeeding is amazing, amazing, in, not just for attachment purposes, but for you, yourself. Oh, my God. 
it was literally the 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 sort of hormones released the you know the are just amazing amazing the oxytocin which is the love the bonding hormone that's released during breastfeeding i mean people pay money to buy drugs to give them a hundredth of the feeling that you get from breastfeeding the the rush the high just the only word for it is bliss mm -hmm. um and the women i know who've had trouble breastfeeding but i'm speaking from the women i know rather than as a global statement are women who are very patriarchal and have a patriarchal view of the breast as being exclusively se sexual and therefore breastfeeding is kind of revolting to them because it's like well it feels like having sex with a baby it's bizarre and weird they've actually said this katie price mm -hmm. you know jordan in england the the glamour model yeah yeah I've, I've i've actually heard women on the other side of the spectrum get quite controversial when they say they get aroused by being um in the act of breastfeeding look some women say that i never experienced it uh, so i can't comment at all uh, this is not something i've experienced maybe they do they seem to i don't know i don't it, not even for one second in fact on a physical level um the baby's not even suckling the nipple which a lot of people seem to think is what goes on with breastfeeding the baby sucks the nipple into its throat so it's kind of sucking on on the breast and the nipples down here in its little throat mm -hmm. so it's not like it's got it's not like a lover um it's literally like just pulling it into its throat and it's not sexy at all you don't i didn't i'm not speaking for other women but on a physical level i didn't even really feel it it was okay. this yeah it wasn't it wasn't like a lover it wasn't like a you know which is a completely you really feel it when you're in an erotic situation but this was because it's in its throat it almost felt like a kind of fluttering on the skin more than anything and what i felt was this ecstasy this hormonal ecstasy because it's the greatest drug known to man. There's literally nothing like this. Um, and the attachment's the byproduct. So if you're interested in an attachment with a baby, mm -hmm. breastfeeding is the way to go. There are other ways, but it's the ideal also in terms of nutrition, intestinal flora for the child, yada, yada, yada. There are a whole lot of ways. Co-sleeping is fantastic for attachment, mm -hmm. but it doesn't apply if you're overweight. They actually counsel against it if you're very overweight because you can crush the baby. If you're not breastfeeding, they counsel you against it because you are less sensitive to the baby. Mm -hmm. uh, women who are breastfeeding are hormonally attuned to wake up the minute a child makes a poop. When you're not breastfeeding, you are not hormonally attuned and you don't wake up as easily. Um, there are all sorts of... Uh, Co-sleeping has a ton of rules. That's, that's one of the things that actually has rules, really serious rules, because you can kill a child. And children have been suffocated. Interestingly, though, in the countries, people always go, oh, SIDS, 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 with um, co-sleeping, absolute bullshit. In the countries where co-sleeping is the norm, they have the lowest rates of SIDS in the world. And in fact, more kids die of SIDS. But those are statistics people don't like looking at because co-sleeping is just bliss. They don't cry. You know, this whole thing where, where parents are going insane because the child's crying. Of course the child's crying because the child is literally physically designed to be next to the mother. You know, we're mammals. We're not reptiles. You don't lay an egg and then go and sleep in the next room. We are literally mammals. And the child is the... the I haven't got the stats, they're in the book, stats off the top of my head, where the actual body temperature of the mother regulates the infant's body temperature and heartbeat. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's fucking amazing. It is fucking amazing. So they're literally designed to have skin to skin contact with the mother. Okay. And when they don't have that, they scream because they've gone into a panic. Also, because the baby hasn't individuated, the child doesn't know that you're coming back. So it's like you've died. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a whole bunch of levels. 
And I think a lot of people who are uninformed um, start applying an intellectual prison to basic biology. And it becomes almost like a philosophical prison. It's, it's like, this isn't a philosophy, this is biology. Um, you know, I mean, you may not think it, it fits in with your ideology, but it's not about that. It's about the child's ability to regulate itself and the mother passes that on. You were a dysregulated child. That's why you attempted suicide. I was a dysregulated child. That's why I attempted suicide. When you have a regulated child, they don't do that because even though they can be incredibly unhappy, self-destruction is not on the radar. They don't feel worthless because that sense of being regulated is attachment is a form of love. And you're giving the baby this regulation. And when they don't have that as an adult, they attempt to regulate themselves with drugs, with alcohol, with promiscuity, with porn, with million things in a desperate attempt to try to manage what feels unmanageable. Whereas if you teach a baby regulation through intimacy, they don't have that. They're very Zen. One of the most astonishing things I learned, and this was, once again, homeschooling was an evolution of the attachment. I didn't know anyone who did it, and it wasn't because of any formal philosophy, as I must stress that. Um, because I actually interviewed, I'll get to that in a minute, I actually interviewed, um, Oh, what's her name? The the couple who are at the helm of attachment parenting, the husband and wife, really, really famous. I've gone completely blank. Well, that'll that'll tell you how little I'm attached to the kind of formal philosophy. I've literally forgotten their names. Um, they and I didn't like her at all. I thought she was very um, hysterical. That's probably the best word. I, I didn't really take to her, right. um, even though a lot of their views I, I love, you know, and I agree with, but I didn't like her particularly as a person. And um, what I observed when I saw a lot of homes, properly homeschooled children rather than neglected homeschooled children, is how Zen these kids were, how calm. And we've We've got this whole cultural ideal that all children are nightmares, they're screaming horrors, they're difficult, they're noisy, they're this and that. And they're really not. It's just our culture is completely dysfunctional. So we have dysfunctional kids who act out. And when you see all these homeschool kids, they're so zen. We stayed with a family in France who Bethesda's um, pen pals. Mm -hmm. And there were like five kids. Fair enough, they, they had a bit of money. So they weren't, as I said before, economics have to play a part in it when you're parenting, sad fact. But they, she was able to homeschool without any financial worries at all. And the kids were amazing. The connection between these children, the love, the ease, the calmness, the interconnect it's just it's just you don't see this in schools you see tension and acting out and there are kids falling apart and there's this and that because these kids are, are too young to be out in the world and i think when these children feel protected and they're the opposite of spoiled they're actually really really helpful children my daughter always was so helpful and um, even now she does the dishes every day. She does a whole bunch of things. And once again, please don't think that we are without issues because the divorce was not fun for her in particular. So um, she had certain problems after that. But there is an attachment, a security in these kids that you don't see in other kids. You see lots of other things, but you don't see the security that they have when it's done properly, you know, as opposed to, yeah. So when you think of the non-attached mother, the mother who is insufficiently attached to her children, yeah. what are some of the red flags to look out for? Acting out the kid. When I see, I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, 
in this mothering group I told you I belonged to when Bethesda was a baby, Bethesda was literally the calmest baby in the whole room. The other, we, I remember one meeting where every single baby was screaming except her. And I remember her lying there just looking around with this kind of agitated expression as if to say, why are all these babies so upset? And she was so calm. But eventually their crying made her cry because she was very empathetic. And the baby she clicked most with was this beautiful, okay, I don't mean aesthetically, I mean as a little baby, he wasn't aesthetically beautiful. I mean, he was a beautiful natured baby. This beautiful little skinny boy who was so clearly intelligent, just you could see his eyes, just the most alert expression. He was, he was gorgeous. I, I loved his alertness and his just this shimmering intelligence. And he and Bethesda loved each other. They really, really got on very well. And he was a very happy little boy. And then his mother, who was a lovely woman, really lovely woman, but clearly had very little idea of what to do with the baby. And she used to watch me with like, wow, why are you with this baby all the time? And she said, I'm going back to work full time. And I said, but he's six weeks old. And she said, oh, that's fine. That's fine. I'll just, you know, my, my husband can look after him or we'll just put him in a, you know, knapsack and carry him around. And I'm thinking, mm, this is not going to turn out. She put him in daycare. And you have never seen, it was one of the saddest things I have ever seen, a case of clinical depression in a newborn where he stopped smiling, he stopped laughing, he stopped interacting. I just, over the, over the months, you just saw the downhill slide of this kid. By the end of that year, or the, some, a little, yeah, it was about the end of the year or just after that, she and I went out with our babies in strollers. And this kid hated his mother so much by that point. She literally couldn't even get him into the stroller. And she, she was like fighting with this, this baby. And he was like, get off me. You could just see him like, get your hands off me. I hate you. It was just... It was like, fuck. It was really distressing because I could see the pain in him and she, I could see the complete incomprehension in this woman because, as I said, she wasn't a bad woman. It's not like, oh, you're a wicked woman. It's literally, she, she didn't know what babies needed. So it was like, sure, I can put him in daycare. That's fine. He's great. I love him. And it's like, no, no, this isn't going to work very well. Anyway, she literally could not get this child in the stroller. Bethesda, who was already securely in the stroller, was looking over at him. This is amazing. And she just extended a tiny hand to this little boy. And she calmed him. Because it was through being in daycare that this baby had learned. He to his little baby brain, his little half-formed brain, his mother had abandoned him. And she was this figure who periodically appeared, um, but she was, she'd basically abandoned him. And he was peer modulated. This was a baby who only had stopped responding to adults because adults were unreliable, inconsistent. This, I'm talking from his perspective, that he was inconsistent, he was dumped in these places when it suited her. She wasn't there when he needed her. He learned that adults don't give you what you need. So he refused to take any kind of instruction from this woman anymore. But he listened to the person because it was through daycare that all the little children started turning to each other. And then people are surprised when, you know, teenagers start joining gangs or become peer governed because the adults have no more authority. They weren't there. They, adults are untrustworthy. Adults are the enemy. Adults are the bad guy because they're not there when you need them. All they want, they want you when it's convenient. And that's what the child learns. 
And I was astonished. This little baby girl was able to calm this almost hysterical boy where his mother was just failing. And she got pregnant. She kind of almost acknowledged that she'd failed with him. I mean, he was the angriest little boy. It was, it was awful. It was so awful because I just remembered this happy little, he looked like a tiny little worm. You know, he was so cute. And he was a happy little worm. And um, you just saw this kid and I just could see him as an adult. Like I remember seeing him gnawing on this rusk and he just, and I, it would almost, you saw the rage in, in everything he did, just this lack of needs met. Um, and when she had her check, second child, I remember she said to me, I'm gonna do this one differently. And she took a year or more off with the second one because she'd, she'd watched me, because everyone was watching me thinking, oh, Antonella is some ridiculous hippie. And, I, you know, I wasn't for the first thing, but I was, I was actually applying instinct. I was following my instinct for once and um, rather than a philosophy. And yeah, and she with the second one said she was, and the second one was so much easier to deal with because of that. Mm. But she'd completely fucked up with this first kid, not out of wickedness. It was a very common situation. So, are you, so yeah. Are you skeptical of the idea that um, children that are kind of difficult in their behavior in the first few years can be that way because of either temperament or neurobiological issues? No, no. I mean, obviously, if you've got some kind of neurobiological congenital defect, that's a different story. We're talking about sort of normal kids rather than, you know, really serious congenital defects. The fact is we are born with something, I'm not giving exact figures, but it's ballpark, 20 from memory, 25% of our brains finished. Almost three quarters of our brains will be completed once again, this is from memory, be completed by the first three years. They are literally created. Our brains are physically created by our experiences of caregiving or lack thereof. They did, um, one of the most famous studies was in Romania. I don't know if you've heard of this study. Yeah where they looked at these orphans who'd been abandoned at birth in orphanages with no resources. And so some of these kids were literally tied to the cot. Their nappies weren't changed. They were fed intermittently. They were sort of haphazard. They were left in their cots with bottles. They were never looked at. They were never, at, and their brains were minuscule. They were like, they were literally like blank spaces in their, when they did um, CAT scans, they had literally blank spaces where neural matter should be. And people who adopted them would return these kids because they were, they were effectively sociopathic. That's a lot of them were autistic, heavily autistic. They had no understanding of connection because they'd never experienced intimacy and they were completely dysfunctional. They rages, not just no comprehension of, of what it is to be attached. And when you are looking at a dysfunctional child, assuming it's not congenital or they haven't got some kind of physical you know, digestive disorder or something like that. I'll give you a tiny example of that. When Bethesda was a baby, she almost like never cried. Okay, literally, sorry to tell you, if you, if you're in, if you attach properly, they don't cry. They barely cry. Crying is actually, as a culture, we understand crying as something babies do, almost as if they, it's just something they do, like breathing, and it's not. Fascinating, because I, yeah, I didn't really cry as a baby either. I always I was about, it unusual. I was about to go into that because there are two sorts of babies who don't cry, those who have their needs met and those who give up on having their needs met. Okay. 
okay? Which is what happens a lot in like daycare centers. The baby just gives up. So they stop crying because they know nobody's gonna to come to them. It's like people say, you know, um, sleep training, they call it, where the baby will scream its guts out for a week. Nobody goes to it. It will eventually stop. Mm -hmm. But that's not a good thing because babies cry to communicate. When a baby's crying, it's not being a pain in the ass. It's literally trying to communicate a need because it can't speak and it can't formulate the need. In its, so it's just going, I'm hungry, I'm scared, I'm lonely. You know, it's communication. And in our culture, they'll go, oh, don't worry about it. It's just crying as if it were, oh, it's just breathing. It's not, it's trying to talk to you. It's trying to tell you something. So when a baby cries, pay attention, you know, pay attention. I remember a woman said to me, why do you run to your daughter every time she cries at night? You know, if you stop paying attention to her, she'll stop. And it's like, yeah, I, I know, I want to avoid that. I want to raise a child who is cognizant of its needs and is able to articulate them rather than just giving up and becoming introverted because it doesn't believe that its needs can be met. There's this fundamental conviction that you instill in the child by not meeting its needs that its needs won't be met and that it's it's not worth having its needs met. Okay. How do you differentiate between a child's needs and a child's wants? Oh, serious? What, what age are we talking about here? Uh, well, let's say when the child can't really articulate itself very properly because it hasn't learned how to talk, let's say zero to yeah. two. How do you differentiate those two things? There is no differentiation. Meet them. There is no such thing as spoiling an infant. There is literally not. If a child wants your attention, it needs your attention. Can Obviously, you spoil a toddler? To... Sorry? Can you spoil a toddler? No, no. I'm talking about older children. If older children get stroppy and, and, and difficult. And even then, you know, even then, um, I mean, I'm so busy. I became so busy after the divorce that I wasn't able to meet my daughter's needs as they should have been met. And there were issues because of that. Um, children need attention. And it is through giving them that attention that we grow. It's not just this unilateral thing. It's not just like, oh, oh yeah, here I am giving this kid all this attention. What do I get out of it? Well, actually buckets, but you have to slow down to recognize it. And that's not something everyone has the luxury of doing. Mm -hmm. That's why in the book, in Mama, Love, Motherhood and Revolution, I put a big stress on slowing down when kids are little. It's critically important. That's why it was, there's all this stuff in it about slow living and slowing down and de-emphasizing certain prior, you know, previous priorities because the world of children is small and slow. And unless the parents make a conscious effort to decelerate, to slow down, to meet the child in its smallness and slowness, you're gonna run into problems. And the problems will be, will, will manifest in terms of dysfunction in the child and also um, just troubled attachment and distance as they get older. Mm -hmm. Like you said before, something quite interesting, which is once again is a cultural myth, this idea of temperament. Oh, my child was an asshole from the moment it was born. It was screaming all the time. It's crying. They've actually shown statistically, they've done astonishing studies that children who are extremely agitated at birth, as I said, putting aside congenital issues, yada, yada, normal, normal kids. Kids who cry all the time and are fretful and difficult and children who are fretful and difficult had mothers who were very anxious during the pregnancy. Um, other issues involved in the maternal mood. And mm -hmm. there is no such thing as a difficult child whose needs are met, a normal difficult, a, you know, neurologically normal, physically normal child whose needs are met. I remember Bethesda started crying at one point as a baby 
Um, and she'd never done that before. And she every night she'd be screaming, screaming. And I'm like, what? What's going on? She's not done this before. What am I? What's changed? And the first thing I remember thinking was, what has changed? And I realized that I'd started eating chocolate, family bar of chocolate every day to keep my energy up because I was breastfeeding, which is every breastfeeding mother knows exhausting. It's bliss, but it's exhausting. You literally feel like the, the blood is being, you know, marrow is being sucked out of your bones at times. So I was eating all this chocolate for energy. And the caffeine in the chocolate was being transferred through the breast milk. So she was wired. I cut the chocolate, crying stopped. This also weirdly applies to cruciferous vegetables. Cruciferous veg babies hate cruciferous vegetables because their digestive systems are too immature. And they're Can you tell our audience what cruciferous vegetables are? Cabbage, broccoli, okay. um, stuff like that. You know, uh, the, there are others, but that's sort of, you know, the cruciferous vegetable group, which are technically really healthy. And you'd think, wow, I'm breastfeeding, I'll eat broccoli because that's full of nutrients. But in fact, broccoli, chili is also a main culprit, garlic with many, many babies, milk, dairy milk. So while you're breastfeeding, you have to keep your diet really simple because of the baby's immature digestive system. So if you eat chili or anything with caffeine or drink caffeine or you know, broccoli or all these, all these danger foods, there are actually lists of them online, foods you shouldn't eat while you're breastfeeding. And I didn't know that, this was learning experience. And so, um, I cut out the chocolate, the tears stopped. I actually had to drink soy milk because she was starting to get all this reflux when I drank dairy. And um, so the diet became extremely bland and healthy, like lots of protein, all this sort of stuff. So that was, that's one reason my ba babies can cry. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's it, being a new parent. This is where the community is supposed to step in or family, but most families know fuck about this these days because they're just as dysfunctional as you are. So they don't know. They're like, Oh God, the kid's crying. He's got colic. Give it a drug. If you go to a doctor, they will actually give you a fucking drug to stop the baby crying. They won't ask you, Oh, hang on. You're breastfeeding. Are you eating chocolate or cruciferous vegetables? They just go, oh, it's colic. Give the baby a drug, which has an incredibly bad neurological impact on the kid. But it's this, basically, it's, it's, it's like this, this domino effect of stupidity and ignorance. Um, not necessarily wickedness, but ignorance and stupidity. It's, um, it's really depressing, actually when you address it that way. But there are lots of reasons. If your baby is crying, there is a reason. That's the point I'm making. It's not because the baby is an asshole trying to stop you sleeping. It's crying to tell you something. And the same thing applies to a kid. If you've got, I know from raising Bethesda that if a child feels attached, it doesn't act out. This whole idea of the terrible twos never happened never ever i'm not lying i had lots of problems after the divorce that's an older child that's a different thing altogether to be discussed maybe later but in terms so you, of you didn't have a, a a point in which you found raising your daughter was difficult because she was going through toddlerhood and all of the things associated with that behavior no 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 it was literally I'm not lying because, as I said, I'm quite happy to go into the horror of the post-divorce experience. But as a toddler, it was bliss. I've got the photographs to prove it. It was so much fun. She was just, but she was very securely attached, like super mm -hmm. securely attached. She was such a fun kid. She was joyous. I've got a book, a little book. Um, I used to write down all the things she would say that were hilarious because, you know, when they're really tiny, they make all these mistakes. Yeah. And also, I mean, the poetry, we're talking E. Cummings. It was, you know, one of the things she said, you know, I love you. What was it? I love you in a wonderland of flowers or something, something extraordinary. Like this, like three rockets. She, 
she was very advanced uh, because I'd applied certain principles. I was reading to her from two weeks onwards, like hours every day. And she spoke her first word at four or five months and not a sentence, just a word. And then didn't speak again for like two months. And then she started talking and never stopped. And we noticed that her ability to speak was what was when she was about two and a bit, I was reading Mother Goose to her one day and I was so tired that I missed a word or a couple of words. And she she said, Mama, you've you that's wrong. And I said, What? And she said, You've, you know, you've forgotten the word. And I said, What what did you just say? She said, you know, something like, you know, rub it up, dab three minutes up. And how do you think? And I'm like, oh my God, she knows these off by heart. And we had her tested by developmental psychologists because I said to my husband, this is not normal. Half her friends aren't even talking. There's something different about her. And there was. How she old was, was she when, this, when she was talking? Um, she spoke her first word, uh, as I said, four to five months. And then she um, started speaking... I mean, it was baby speaking, you know, da, da, you know, with, with mm -hmm. little baby inflection. It wasn't, she wasn't like Shakespeare, but she was, you know, pronouncing polysyllabic words in her second year. Like um, a kindergarten teacher who lived in the block, mm -hmm. he didn't li live there. He was the boyfriend of a woman who lived there. And he stopped her one day in her stroller and he said, where have you been today with your mummy? And she said, she piped up and she said, um, we've been picking hibiscuses together. <laughs> and he nearly fell over backwards. He was like, what? And she was so articulate for a little kid. And we discovered she was in the like top 0.1% of the population intellectually and emotionally. And how much of that do you think is you and how much of that is her brain? Well, I helped create her brain. As I'm telling you before, there's this, we are born with like 20 to 25% of okay. a functional brain. And that 20 to 25% is basically the reptile, what they call the reptile brain, which governs mm -hmm. heartbeat and breathing and lung function and all that. The actual prefrontal cortex is pretty well shaped by caregiving. So your parents created your, or whoever looked after you, created your brain okay my parents and grandparents who lived with us created my brain our brains are literally created by our parents we're not born this idea that we're hatched with a functional brain it's just the way i am um i was born this way bullshit it's 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 it's, it's actually biologically impossible no one is born with a full brain the prefrontal cortex which is the most recent part of the brain to evolve um, in terms of hum humanity and human development is created by caregiving. So any deficits you have um, are created by your parents or caregivers. Okay. okay. So and any advantages you have are created. So you can literally, literally physically expand your child's brain, the neural pathways by reading to it um, okay. as a, as an infant and as a toddler, by engaging with it, by looking into the child's eyes as much as you can, that's hugely important. Lots and lots of eye contact. This how, is how, really old fascinating. Your, how old are your uh, stepchildren? Um, 32 uh, and 30. Oh my God, they are so past this. Okay, I thought you might have tiny ones. Um, yeah, but I mean, the eye contact is critically important. That's massively important. That there are all sorts of things that happen in your baby's brain when you gaze into its eyes. Magic happens. Okay. Well, yeah. this is a fascinating view. Um, I've never heard this view before, stated by scientists. So I'm interested in it. Well, have um, you? If you look at the, if you look at the book, have a look at the book. Yeah. Have you got the book there? You just showed it. Look yeah. at the quote on the cover. Yeah. Uh, KJS Anand, Neil Rosen, von Rosenstein, Laureate in Pediatrics, the most important book. KJS Anand is a professor of anesthesiology, pediatrics, and neurobiology. 
he won the equivalent of the Nobel in pediatrics. That award is the Nobel of pediatrics in the world. He is one of the most humane and brilliant people. He's not a friend of mine, I might add. That was not a favor. Mm -hmm. He read the book and he said, I literally, he, there's a longer quote inside where he said, I have literally never considered this. And it tallies into the science. If you start okay. researching the science, um, we know a lot more about the way brains grow now and the way they evolve and what happens when they don't get certain things. It's not just a matter of opinion. It's a matter of fact. That's the difference. These are actual studies they've done with CAT scans, with all sorts of things. These are just, this is science. This is not, like when you came at me before, it's like the philosophy of attachment parenting. It's, that's bullshit. It's nothing to do with anything. I'm actually looking at the reality of um, attachment in terms of neurological evolution. Okay. Rather than having an opinion, which is like, well, I think it's better if you make a child wear a pink dress. You know, that's an opinion. Okay. Um, this is actually how do you get a child to be the most it can be? And not just that, how do you expand as a human being? How do you evolve emotionally? Because we, we are all born with challenges in one way or another. Okay. You know, whatever, whatever those challenges may be, whether they're economic or trauma or whatever. It's, it's, I was explaining this to my daughter the other day. I said, you know, there is no life. It's, the Buddhists say it as well. It's like, which house has been untouched by loss? Every house, you knock, you knock on the door of every house and they will have experienced loss in a different form. Mm -hmm. You know, because this one woman was going, I think it was, I can't remember the parable, but it was like, um, why has my son died? Why have I been so unlucky? And it's like, babe, go and knock on everybody's door and find out the stories of life. And the trick of it is how do we evolve? How do we evolve as parents? How do we evolve as grandparents? How do we evolve as partners to those we love? Um, how do we evolve as friends? How do we evolve as human beings in the context of the planet. This is all, they're all degrees of, it's like concentric circles of attachment, you know. And I find the limitation of many views now um, is quite interesting because I tend to approach things from a logical perspective. And I find that there's this kind of insane, what I call sort of, um, intellectual noodling where people just be, sort of fall down rabbit holes of opinions and philosophy and everything it's like well let's just look at the facts here let's actually look at what's happening to babies let's look at what's happening to families let's look at the fact that families are fracturing um not because people are evil or bad or because they're not christian or any of that families are fracturing because we don't have the cultural support in place and it's very, very difficult for just two people or even in many cases, one lone parent to raise a child well and earn money and also have a sense of existing outside the family. You know, I mean, it's, it's a very complex thing and it requires, I think it requires it, first of all, my philosophy is very much the be the change, you know, be the change you want to see in the world. That's all we can pretty much do. And if we can actually have more of a role in terms of petitioning to MPs or getting involved in community actions, grassroots, all that, fantastic. But for those who are too busy to run off their feet, just try to be the change in the way you can. And if you have children in your life, slow down. My, I'm a great advocate of, of getting rid of the fucking television. I really am, unless you use it as a DVD player. Because if you don't use it as a DVD player, all sorts of bullshit conditioning is gonna creep in. Okay. Um, that is a huge problem I have with TV. And the same goes with the internet. Bethesda didn't have access to a computer until she was 
I think eight. And we had a television the size of a postage stamp. It was the smallest television you have ever seen. It was like this big. <laughs> um, but we used it as a DVD player. It wasn't even plugged into the, the antenna. And so she had a library of really sweet films and appro age appropriate films. And so she was just a really happy little kid. And the unhappiness kicked in after the divorce. That was very hard. It's still a challenge. That was a real learning curve. I think that might be my next book um, because it's, it's a, a real learning curve. It's really hard. It's really hard. Okay. And made me realize a lot of things. And there are lots of problems with the legal system in particular, but we won't go into that now, but that the legal system is fucked. Okay. It's fucked, yeah. So g getting back to your specific view about the relationship between uh, mothers and children with uh, mm. nature versus uh, nature versus nurture. Is mm. it your view that most of the emotional and cognitive talents of a human being are determined by the caregiving they receive by the parents? Repeat the question. Sorry, I didn't hear that properly. Is it my opinion that what? That most of the emotional and cognitive talents of a human being yes. are uh, things that are caused by the caregiving of that human being by their mother. Yes, I don't think all of them. I think there's obviously a genetic component that we don't yet know, but I think most of them, yeah, because what you can have with someone is you can have someone who's extraordinarily talented, but if the caregiving isn't up to scratch, they implode. Mm -hmm. If you look at someone like Kurt Cobain, perfect example, where you had this extraordinary talent, um, and he just didn't have the scaffolding to hold the talent. Talent is never enough in itself. Um, you need the security and the scaffolding, which is what the parents put, all caregivers put in place with the baby. Um, and then they can utilize the talent. But if you have this completely like lopsided or, or fractured experience of caretaking the talent will be it's too big a burden and the person will collapse under it which is why it's a trope to have the tortured genius you know um and then you have people who have the security and the capacity to hold the talent and they're the ones who can move forward with it so the talent is actually a burden in a way, people who are intensely talented in whatever area, that's kind of a burden. And you have to adapt your whole life to meet that talent, to hold that talent. Um, and so you need to be fairly secure to actually persist because otherwise they just collapse. It's too much. They can't cope with everything that comes with it. So that's why you have a lot of high profile people who you know just don't cope just can't cope you know the Britney Spears is of this world and, um, and then you get people like Brad Pitt who whilst he had some you know issues with addiction you know you're not going to have a normal life if you're that famous was by all accounts loved securely loved so he had a sense of his own self-worth which has enabled him to sustain a career for a million years okay but um but so yeah i think talent i don't know um i think intellectual talent can definitely be created as i said before because they've shown that brains it, like the more you read the more you connect with the baby it's neural pathways are going to be going boom 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 expanding so it's literally going to be smarter and they know this they know that something as simple as reading to a child is going to make the kid brighter. They know this. They know that breastfed children um, achieve so much more than bottle-fed children. It's, these are just studies they've done. They know all this stuff. You are literally impeding. This is not to say that if your child is bottle-fed or whatever, that it's going to be a, a loser. I'm, I'm saying that its capacity won't be as big as it could have been. 
So if you have a brilliant child who is bottle fed and not looked after completely, imagine what it could have been like otherwise. It would have been like fucking intergalactic brilliant. So, um, so that's the thing you do. And also it's just the connection, disconnection with one's children is the cause of so much misery. Not necessarily when they're babies, but later in life, it's the cause of so much fucking stress and misery. And it's like, well, you know, in some cases, you've just got to recognize that there have been, there's been, there have been so many errors and mistakes that you just do the best you can, you know. But mm -hmm. if they're young enough, really inform yourself as to how you can strengthen that attachment. Um, because you're dealing with your own future happiness, no matter how much you think now, oh, it's irrelevant, they're a baby. Oh, I loved Angelina Jolie's comment. That was just astonishing. Just the ignorance of that comment where she said, you know, babies are blobs. And it's like, what fucking planet are you on? Have you, how much time have you spent with a baby? Because watching Bethesda in those first weeks and months was the most extraordinary experience. I mean, you're looking at this creature and you can see consciousness increasing incrementally. You just see this expansion of consciousness in the eyes. Physically, all these changes, you know, one day they've, they haven't got eyelashes and the next day they've got lashes. They don't even sweat until they're a particular age and then all of a sudden they're sweating. It's just, I mean, it's astonishing. And then when consciousness comes in, the verbal consciousness, the ability to put things together. I mean, it's, it's, it's just extraordinary. And it's something that's not much talked about because you have to slow down to see it. It's not extraordinary in the sense of, you know, snorting a line of Coke and, and going to see um, a gig by your favorite band. It's not that adrenaline high, it's an oxytocin high. It's a love high. And it's also intellectually fascinating. But you see the value we have in this culture, we're an adrenaline driven culture. So the only things we value are adrenaline things like fast cars, taking drugs, getting pissed, going out for the night, dancing, fucking, all this stuff. Adrenaline, 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 adrenaline. Whereas what I'm talking about is oxytocin, which is love. So all the things you have to do to get an oxytocin high are devalued in our culture. And that's really interesting. That's what the book's about. Okay. So if you look, yeah. So this is interesting. So you think that love is many things. Uh, one mm -hmm. of the things that all forms of love have in common is self-sacrifice. Yes. And love is grounded in the hormone oxytocin. Yes. Bonding. Yes. Can you have love without oxytocin or or? Is that no, I don't think, no. Oxytocin is, um, is the attachment. It, it literally, the hormone starts flooding you when you attach. Like when you, um, I'll tell you one thing that's fascinating. Uh, the prevalence of anal sex in pornography okay. is actually fascinating. That's so interesting. You know why? Because most anal sex doesn't involve eye-to-eye -eye contact. Some does, but mostly it doesn't. And it's the eye-to-eye -eye contact that increases oxytocin when you're making love. I would imagine porn is anti-oxytocin generally. Sorry? I would imagine porn is anti-oxytocin generally. That's exactly it. You've just hit the nail on the head. The whole point is breaking the oxytocin cycle so you don't get bonded with your partner. It's like, why are you fucking them? Weird. Why would you want to fuck someone you're not bonded with? What a weird thing to do. Why would you do that? That's well, really strange. Some of them would say freedom. And some of them would say it's arousing because it's naughty, because it's not bonded. I would say that they're justifying the fact that they have an impaired capacity for intimacy. I would actually say that many of what we understand to be the philosophies that, by which people live in modern life are really no more than justifications. They're like... This feels comfortable for me. I am more comfortable having sex when I'm not bonded. I feel uncomfortable when I'm having bonded sex because underneath, I find intimacy threatening because it was never something I could rely upon. That's actually what's going on in the psyche. 
the mind will justify anything. The minds will justify taking crack, you know? <laughs> Literally, the mind will justify slashing the body. The mind will justify cannibalism. Minds can justify anything. You know, you, you, you hear like cannibals, like, can I, do you mind if I carve a bit of your skin? You know, it was like Armin, what was his name? Armin Muse, the German guy, very famous case where he put an ad, this gay cannibal. <laughs> and he put an ad saying, I'm looking for someone who wants to be eaten. You know? Yes, I saw that. He was very polite. He was really nice. He was a polite guy. He didn't go and sort of, you know, abduct a kid and eat him or anything. He was like putting a little polite German ad and, and saying to yeah, you, know, is there Consensual there? cannibalism. Pardon? Consensual cannibalism. And so he, he, um, he put this ad and he got this guy who said, it's my fantasy to be eaten and murdered. And he said, well, oh, this is really great. You and I, we're just perfect match. So he consensually chopped this guy up, fried him, ate him, killed him. It was still murder. But what I'm, the point I'm making is that the mind can justify anything. That instead of saying, hang on a minute, this is really dysfunctional. There's something really not right about this. These men, both of them were so damaged that they were able to justify it within this kind of almost weird, what, what was so weird about that case was the politeness of it. <laughs> it was, that's why it was really strange because you have these incredibly destructive, perverse acts, which were contextualized by this almost corporate delicacy it's like, would you, would you mind terribly if I, you know, cut your penis off and fried it and ate it for dinner? It's like, no, no, I would, I would like that very much. You know, it was, that's what was so bizarre. It wasn't like some completely dysfunctional person abducting someone and torturing them and eating them. It, this was, it was the politeness that was the kicker. The exchanges between these two men were so nice. And well, an um, attempt to get it internalized in the culture by surrounding it with of their social norms, like looking out for consent. Yes, making yeah, that's exactly it. They, they, were, they were, that's their mind's desperate attempt to regulate this unregulated emotion and trauma, obviously, with both of them. So the way they did that was to couch it in this language. And it's the same thing you're talking about. It's like, the thing that somebody may find really erotic about um, sex is, is the fact that they have no feelings. They don't give a fuck about the person they're fucking. And it's, that is not human biology. That's not where we're designed. And the minute somebody starts thinking about, um, like that, it's the mind rationalizing incredible trauma. It's, it's an intimacy wound so you that is somebody... rationalized. Somebody who would feel aroused for those reasons. If yeah. Somebody has trauma in their past. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You see, the, the problem is that a lot of um, sexual critics are coming from a moral angle, like, oh, that's bad. It's unchristian. That's got nothing to do with anything. I'm not interested in that stuff at all, what, whether people think it's naughty or bad or, you know, I see, in fact, the attribution of behavior as bad as being responsible for creating dysfunction because people feel unacceptable and judged. Um, and you can't do that. What you're looking at is what is this behavior saying? What, how did this, what is the matrix of this behavior? Why do you find it erotic? Why do you respond more to people you're disconnected with than people you're connected with? That's weird. Let's let's unpack that. That's what I'm interested in, because it's just not normal um, in terms of the human physiology and our capacities, right? It's not normal. And when you see that kind of deviation from the normal thing, which would be like the way we're designed biologically, you would say, I really like you. You make me feel good. I really enjoy you, we really connect. And the sexuality evolves from that conversation. There's also animal attraction involved in the, in the, you know, in the equation. But when you start looking at someone who gets off on 
uh, humiliating someone or hurting them or ghosting them or whatever the, whatever the pattern is or um, or porn where you where you get people who are literally responding um, to a, a screen with more passion than they respond to a living person that's or they're looking at a screen when they're with a living person that's just so fucking weird if you actually take three steps back and look at human sexuality and look at human behavior rather than being in the thick of it you actually step back from it and address it as you would an extraterrestrial and then you start seeing it more clearly and you're saying, fuck, that's really dysfunctional. That's really weird. Um, not it's bad, but how does this happen? What interests me is how things happen. Um, I'm not interested in our philosophy. I talk about this in Apple quite a bit, by the way. There's a lot about philosophy in Apple. Um, and as I said before, people often make the mistake of assuming that I'm an advocate for formalized attachment parenting. I'm not. I'm an advocate of attachment and parenting and attached parenting, but not attachment parenting TM. Um, so it's a very different way of approaching it. Mm -hmm. And I'm an advocate of attachment in every form. And I think, particularly with sex, and Apple, the new book is a lot about sex. There's a bit about sex in Mama as well. There's a bit about porn yeah. and sex. But when you're looking at sexuality, it's become fashionable now. And this, this is fascinating. It's become so fashionable to be like, oh, you know, I really want to be choked. I like being held upside down and penetrated by root crop vegetables. I like gangbangs. And the weirder and the more way out, the more socially acceptable it is now. It's, it's like, you know, I'm really, people, have literally learned to categorize sexuality as if they were porn hub sections. Mm -hmm. It's like, um, I like lesbianism or I like this, as if you're in a supermarket and they don't understand what sex is. It's a friend of mine who's a musician said, um, he literally plays and he has women coming up to him and giving him their numbers afterwards. He's quite good looking. And he rings the numbers and they give him their address and he goes around and fucks them and then he leaves. It's like ordering a pizza. And he's, one, he's so isolated emotionally, it's not even funny. And what astonishes me about these women is the danger they're putting themselves in without even thinking. It's like, he could have AIDS. He could have any kind of STD. He could be psychotic. He could... Um, rape them he could literally you're saying come over complete stranger and fuck me it's it's just so fucking weird it's there's literally no sense of self-protection there okay on any level emotional but, or physical as a general and, would you say that in sexuality what is abnormal is is bad what is normal is good no I, I disagree completely with the bad and the good i look at it in terms of functional and dysfunctional I'm not interested in bad and good. I find it interesting that you mentioned bad and good a lot. And I would suggest that these were words that were used a lot when you were a child. That well, there were words when I did uh, that were used quite a lot when I did my PhD in philosophy because it was okay. in ethics. But were they used a lot as a child? Uh, no, you were, no. You weren't called bad. No, I, I was fascinated by ethics in my late teens and early twenties, which is why I became obsessed with ethical theory and okay. uh, writing and analyzing it. And I didn't really think seriously about bad and good until that time. I was much more morality is subjective as a child. I don't like the words bad or good at all. Mm -hmm. I think they're not helpful. I think categorizing behavior as good or bad is not helpful. To anybody it's um it's an attempt to make sense of things mm -hmm. but i don't think it's useful i think dysfunctional and functional are much more interesting words and i think we need to change the way we see people and behavior 
Mm -hmm. And so if you look at sexuality, it's not a matter of, oh, that's bad. It's a matter of, is this really serving you? Is this really serving the other person? Is this serving the wider culture? Is this a helpful thing? Is this something that creates good things? And when I say good things, I mean constructive things for the culture. I don't mean good spiritually. Um, and that's what interests me because I know and have known a lot of suicides. I've known a lot of people who are addicts. I'm not interested in what's good or bad about that. I've seen the pain that creates these issues. I've seen the pain that sex addicts I know are in. Um, porn addicts, my brother who suicided was an entrenched porn addict who had phenomenal issues with intimacy. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal. Porn was so much easier for him, just so much easier because he didn't have to connect. Connection for him was almost impossible. And in fact, in the end, disconnection was just the easiest thing in the world for him mm -hmm. because he could not connect. So when you, uh, think about, when, when you think about the last 50 years, starting mm -hmm. with the sexual revolution in the 60s up to the present yeah. with porn culture everywhere, would you say that last 15 years was dysfunctional? Massively. More than functional? And I go, I'm not going to tell you why. You're going to have to read Apple. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's seriously in there. It's, that's why sex is, that's why it's called sex drugs. It's in there. Apple will explain this stuff. I'm not going to talk about it now. It's in the book. It comes out in, uh, I think, the spring. Mm -hmm. I find out the exact date very soon, but it's kind of slated for the spring 2022. Okay. Um, but it does go, these questions are answered in the book. So I can't tell you. I'd love to, but I That's can't. That's fine. Um, massively dysfunctional. Massively. Massively. Okay and hurt a lot of people. So um, I suppose let's, let's go back to mama then. Um, yes, yeah. One person I know personally who is, has read your book yes. has said to me, she said that she had two children yes. um, when they were very small. They were within like two years of each other. So they weren't um, twins, but they weren't like, you know, five to 10 year siblings yep. apart. And she said one of them was very disagreeable, very cranky, needed to be reined in a lot. The other was perfectly behaved, perfectly, uh, you know, amenable to all the things that you would like a baby to be amenable to, didn't cry very often, et cetera. And she raised both of them exactly the same. No such um, thing. And now they're both adults and they're both relatively happy, healthy, agreeable people. Um, and she felt reading your book like she was a bit judged in a way saying like the second child's bad behavior was her fault but she feels that because that she both raised them the same way she raised them both the same way and they both turned out okay as adults that there was a sense in which the book was attacking her no no this her. is she look there's this misunderstanding as i said before which is kind of dispiriting to be honest um first of all no one raises two children exactly the same way this is complete bullshit it's, my mother always used to use this line. It's like, oh, how did you and your brother turn out so differently? Um, because you were raised in exactly the same way. It's like we were raised in completely different ways. We were technically raised, I mean, we had the same parents and she didn't use any different parenting styles with either of us. So in that respect, we were raised in the same way. But we appeared at different times in her life, at different times in her marriage, um we received different amounts of attention because we he was born after me you know there, there are so many fucking variables in the way kids are raised for example with the first child you parents usually not always met, well they cut their teeth on the first kid you know, so the second one generally has an easier time of it because the parents are cutting their teeth on the first one, working out how to be parents and fucking up a million and one times in the interim, right? Because it's like, oh my God, so that's what that means. Because you're learning from the baby. As much as you're teaching the baby, you are learning how to be a parent. That's what I said before when I said I was born as a mother when my daughter was born. And I always make a point when 
women write about their children's births, uh, birthdays, I always make a point of wishing them a happy birthing day because it was the day that they gave birth. And that's something that's not looked at a lot because we are born as mothers and fathers and stepfathers, you know, because that's an evolution as well. These are all evolutions of the self. And so I very much disagree with this. Everything was the same, nothing changed, balls. How much do we change in the space of a year? I mean, obviously by the time she had the second one, she had much more of a handle on parenting. Equally, sometimes the first child can be the one who's doted upon and the second one seems almost irrelevant. It depends on the whole dynamic with the family. I would have to talk to her about this, not you. It's like, what, did you feel more excited with the first one? Did you feel more competent with the second one? Where were you in your marriage by that time? Um, you know, maybe the husband or partner, whichever, had come in closer because of parenting, or maybe they'd pulled away more. So they were more attached to the second child. There are all sorts of dynamics in relationships. This is this whole fucking idea that we're just islands, you know, where it's like, oh, it was exactly the same. It's like, no, you didn't clone them. Everything was different other than the relationship, maybe the house and, you know, you didn't change the parenting style, but everything else was different. You were a different person. I am not the same person I was one year ago. You know, um, I cannot even imagine having had another child, to be honest, because we did try. I was too old. Um, and it didn't happen. And I was quite philosophical about that, by the way. I was kind of cool with that. I thought, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't, because that's kind of the way I look at life. But in terms of people turning out okay, what does that even mean? It, it's like I've known tons of people who've taken their own lives, who've ended up in rehab, who've divorced, who've had dreadful relationship with their kids. These stories don't always turn out well. You know, maybe her children both felt loved. I don't know. I can't even comment on something like that because I don't know any details about this woman's life. Mm -hmm. So it's just a ridiculous thing to say. It's like, well, my friend thinks, and it's like, well, who is your friend? Well, I can't ask her any questions. I can't say what are the variables in this picture. Mm -hmm. um, maybe as they got older, you know, because the one really good thing about the brain, the human brain, is that there's a big element of plasticity they're discovering even in adulthood that we can still change our brains to an extent. But the, the deep, 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 deep work is in the first, um, first year and the first three years. Mm -hmm. That is the critical work with children. You can actually rectify the damage to an extent later, but it will never be the same, if you see what I'm saying. So that's why I suggest I'm like this wholehearted advocate that if you've got very young children, just forget the world as much as you can while they're little. Just forget it to the extent that you can, other than paying bills and working. But mm. just focus on them because you are literally making, you are literally kind of setting the blueprint for their lives in a lot of ways. And um, I go into more detail in Apple with this, but a lot of this is looked at in Mama. As I said, Mama was quite gentle because I wanted to talk to very busy parents with particularly young children. But I also wanted people to start looking at their own childhood with that, that, with that book. It's like reading it and starting to question things. As you have questioned and as your friend read a bit and she's like, I feel judged. I would also suggest that, that feeling judged had more to do with guilt that she may have been feeling about certain things. And I, I deal with certain things in the book that are going to be trigger points with some people. Mm -hmm. You know, the minute, even the word breastfeeding, I know from experience is a fucking atom bomb with some women. Some women feel the very word. guilty about not having. Yeah. That. Yeah. For whatever reasons they were, you know, whether there are a million reasons why women don't breastfeed because they can't, you know, whatever, because the philosophies, yada, yada. But that's a huge one with women. That is a fucking, fucking atom bomb. And I've seen it and I've seen them stiffen immediately. 
and they become very defensive and they start like, you're judging me, you're judging me. I, you know, I couldn't breastfeed and not every woman wants to, and not every woman should, you know, and it becomes, it doesn't become an easy discussion anymore. It becomes this kind of incredibly loaded charge debate where you're really looking at this woman's guilt um, and sense of adequacy. It's almost like you've attacked her sense of adequacy and that's actually not what I'm doing at all. That's what I'm doing is saying, hey, sit down and even if you can, and I say this later in the book, it's like, even if you can make like a 5% change to your life, we can all make our lives better by 5%. I can too, you know, because I'm so busy sometimes. I forget um, that my daughter needs, even at 15, needs me to just sit down with her and watch a Taylor Swift video, you know, which she, she loves Taylor Swift. We have different tastes in music. Um, <laughs> so, but she needs that. And I forget that sometimes because I'm, I'm a single mother. I have 100% care by the courts. Um, and my life is really busy. It's, it's like I'm constant, I'm, I'm pretty well always here other than when I'm in the studio. I'm always accessible, but not so much emotionally because I'm busy. I'm doing literary column, I'm doing journalism, I'm trying to deal with like the wash is broken down, the fridge broke down the other day. You know, I'm in all this bullshit. My daughter's bed broke down. <laughs> it's, it's like, oh my God, you know, um, just all this administrative bullshit that we all have to deal with on top of work on top of long range career stuff, on top of trying to have a personal life. And it's ridiculous. And most of us do it with so little support. You know, mm. most parents have so little support, whether it's because they've moved to a different city for work reasons or whatever the reason, um, they just are running on empty. Mm -hmm. I do, I, I collapse almost once a year with some horrible bug. Uh, recently, I had like this five week cold. So I have no doubt that- I'm that's glad you're feeling bug. better about that, by the way. I, I actually am, thank God, and thank you, because it was a, a girlfriend of mine who's also a mother has just recently had it, and she's been down for four weeks. And I think that part of the reason these bugs are like getting a foothold is because um, we're overwrought. You know, because if you work and parent particularly, and even when you're married, I might add, or partnered, you've got to focus on your partner as well. I mean, in a way, being a single parent is in that respect kind of easier because you don't have to think about anybody else at all. It's just like, okay, it's me and the kid. I make all the decisions. I do all the work, blah, blah, blah. But when you're in a relationship, it's like the partner needs attention. Mm -hmm. And it becomes this this incredible expenditure of energy, as I was saying before, with very little energy coming in and all of it going out. And that's something that parents have to be careful of, I think, as the child gets older. When they're little, you've just got to accept the fact that you're running on empty and you're going to be running on empty for three years. Okay. It's as simple as that. It's like, you're going to be exhausted. You're, if you do, I know, I, this is going to sound mean, but my personal litmus test generally with a parent, unless the parent is really young, is generally if the parent looks fucking exhausted and they're a mess and they're wearing pants with sick on them and they haven't brushed their hair for a month, they're usually doing a good job. The more pulled together the parent looks, I think nanny. <laughs> generally, if the mother's like in perfect physical shape and her hair's perfect and she's got perfect makeup on and I'm just thinking, hmm, I don't know if you're actually hanging around with your baby that much. Whereas the, I mean, I've seen women and it's, it's quite funny because they're getting on buses and their pants are falling. I mean, I remember going to the zoo once. I mean, my daughter was probably nine months old or something. And, um, and I went to the loo and I didn't have any underpants on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd literally forgotten to put my underpants on. Mm -hmm. I wasn't being sexy. I normally wear underpants. It's not something I do. But I was so preoccupied with everything I had to pack and dress the kid and, oh, have we got this? And did we get the water bottle and, and all this? 
that I'd literally forgotten to put my own underpants on. That's par- that's early parenthood. And you've just got to accept okay. the fact that that's kind of how it's going to be for three years. Do you, you think forget nannies, your- you've mentioned nannies quite a lot. Do you think nannies are very bad things to hire to look after children? Um, for many reasons, I think that if you get a good nanny, it's necessary in certain situations um i think the problem with nannies is that they're a status object Mm -hmm. i think that's a real problem i also think that by definition a nanny is a disruptor in maternal infant attachment by definition, and that will cause problems. Now, something we haven't talked about, but which the book goes into is, you you seem to see men and women having very different roles in relationship to their newborn child. At least that's the impression I got. Is that correct? They do, biologically, yep. So would it be, it would be dysfunctional, for instance, for a baby to be loved and cared and nurtured for primarily by a male parent during absolutely not but but um of course the father should kind of be there as much as he can like i love this idea of baby moons mm-hmm. and uh paternal leave i really am a massive advocate of paternal leave after the birth of a child massive advocate of that I think that if you don't have paternal leave, it's a real fucking problem because a lot of fathers detach and they detach from the woman as well because the woman becomes, I write about this in the book, that the problem is in the traditional 50s model of the family where you had wifey at home with the kid, husband out earning a living, that's a recipe for disaster. It's a recipe for, it's a disruptor. It's a complete disruptor. And anybody who thinks that I have a 1950s model of um, families is, has not read the book properly and doesn't understand what I'm talking about. My ad, I'm advocating family intimacy. And before, if you notice, I said that the father should be actually investing in the mother Mm -hmm. because the mother, let's look at an ideal situation where the mother is capable of breastfeeding intellectually and physically and they have cultural security okay it's an ideal and family security um then the husband the mother has this massive expenditure of energy physical and emotional towards the infant the infant is actually biologically primed for this the infant is born Do you know how babies identify their mother's breasts? Through smell. Mm -hmm. Through smell. The newborn baby isn't fucked up by birth practices. The baby will crawl up the mother's belly and latch on through smell, through the smell of her nipple. It's literally biologically primed to seek out the mother's breast, not the father's nipple or the nanny's nipple, the mother. So any interruption of this biological mandate is going to create problems, okay? Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily life-destroying, but it's going to create problems. Now, in terms of the father, the father's role is initially kind of, and we're talking about biology here, I'm not talking about philosophy, kind of there but on the periphery of the mother initially because of the breastfeeding the biology as the kid the child's capacity to individuate increases then the father comes more into focus if you see what i mean Mm -hmm. because the mother's breast is kind of pivotal here and the baby is not primed babies find you know, there, there are so many levels of this. Again, breastfeeding is an entirely different, very long discussion. 
but the actual priming of the child is to go towards the mother and that's what I'm talking about as the child gets older then dad steps in more because also the child's capacity when it doesn't panic when the mother leaves as much you know if she goes into another room dad takes over child doesn't freak out because if you have an adjusted attached newborn the newborn will always be looking for the mother always be looking for the mother it might adore the father, but its little nurturance radar is going to be towards the locus of nurturance, which is the breast, the mother. And I mean, if you're dealing with bottle fed babies, I don't really think it makes a difference very much, whether it's the father or the mother. But when the breastfeeding is going on, the mother is going to be the star of the show. It's mm -hmm. as simple as that. I think the paternal role becomes increasingly important as the child gets older and this is backed up by people like Steve Biddle who's a professor he's in the book I interviewed Steve he's a professor of psychology and the dad dad comes in later um, I don't really address the paternal role very much in this book because it's about women mainly mm -hmm. a paternal a, a, a deep examination of the paternal role would be another book i have not done this in this book because you know people go but you haven't talked about fathers it's like well i can't do everything i haven't talked about giraffes either um but you can only do so much in one book it's like what eighty thousand words i can't deal with every issue in the world related to parenting mm -hmm. what i've tried to do is talk to mothers mainly. It's also a book for both parents because the father will get more of an idea of certain things about women, but it's a debate. It's a book that's supposed to inspire mm -hmm. and also inspire debate. I, I like people disagreeing with me. I'm not looking for kind of everyone going, yes, sir, no, sir, three bags, four, sir. It's like, really, you disagree with that? Tell me why. I'm interested in that because I expand through hearing your view. I might not agree with it, but either way, I'm going to expand. Um, and it's not it's not a book about the the paternal experience. Okay. There is stuff about it in terms of fatherhood, but it's not a book about the paternal experience. So I don't even pretend for it to be a book about the paternal experience. Um, it's mainly I want women. I've had a lot of women say they feel very validated by it because. Mm -hmm women who are very active in their mothering are often derided dismissed looked down upon a lot of fathers have said that as well about their um in normal sort of heteronormative setups rather than say gay parents or whatever i have a very dear lesbian friend who's in one of the most beautiful marriages i've ever seen and they have raised two astonishing children. So it, you know, they really enjoyed the book because they, it, they tweaked it to apply it to themselves. You know, you can only do so much with one book. Okay. Um, but- well, in One way you could read the book, and I'm, I'm not saying I read it this way, I was curious how you read it, but hmm. do you think there's something dysfunctional about two men raising a child without a maternal figure at all? It's a good question. I have no problem whatsoever with homosexuality, I should add. I've had same-sex relationships myself. Um, I've got lots of gay friends. I've got no issue. In terms of parenting, with gay men who haven't given birth to the children. Mm -hmm. I think there are issues. A lot of people won't like me saying that, but for the reasons we spoke about, which is I don't believe in surrogacy. That's the problem. It's not the gay men I've got a problem with. It's the idea of surrogacy. And that's another discussion. Mm -hmm. The idea of surrogacy is kind of obscene to me. It's not gay men. I don't, I was like, who cares? Gay men are fine. You know, it's like, great. 
whatever floats your boat, I have no problem with that. The idea of surrogacy is a problem to me. And would that be a problem even with a lesbian couple as well? Yeah, with anybody, with surrogacy, in heteronormative relationships, it's a, the surrogacy is the problem. You can get, there are lots of, you know, het, heteronormative cisgender couples who have children and then they have another kid by a surrogate. I've got a problem with that. Surrogacy is the problem. It's not gay men or lesbians or people who produce, you know, are into BDSM or perhaps cisgender people. It's, it's nothing, it's surrogacy that's the issue. So that's why I paused when you asked the question, because it's it's not a question of homosexuality, which is irrelevant, mm -hmm. utterly irrelevant. Um, it's a question of surrogacy, the issue of surrogacy, whether that kid ends up in a heteronormative family or not. Mm -hmm. The issue is surrogacy. So yeah, the question was wrong. Um, but I've got to pick you up on that one because it's it's, I couldn't care less what um, what sexual choices the parents make. Okay. It's, it's about surrogacy. Well, it sounds like, I mean, one plausible way of interpreting the book, and if this is implausible, feel free to correct me. But mm. one thing that the book seems to be saying is parenting was better in the past to a large extent. That in the modern world with consumption, uh, with mass media, with the internet, with things like that, parenting has gotten worse because there's been less attachment. I think elements of parenting was certainly better in the past, elements. And elements are superior now in terms of medical care and all that stuff. But um, elements, I think that if you look at education is certainly better now. You have advantages now that you didn't have before. But... Um, Levels of intimacy. I, for example, I'll give you an example. It's, it's, I remember with my great uncle in Italy, and I was quite close to my great uncle and aunt because we lived there for the time as children. And I went back as an adult before he died. And I was astonished at his level of emotional literacy. I mean, literally astounded. I would walk in the door because I was staying with him. And he would read my face. He would know immediately what was going on with me emotionally because he read faces. He was emotionally literate. And that's something I don't find here in England or in Australia or in America for that, for that matter. People don't read other people emotionally anymore. Hmm. His level of emotional literacy was so high. He had an extraordinary marriage, an amazing, passionate, gorgeous marriage. I mean, these they had sex every single night. <laughs> Can you imagine? I mean, just, you know, people are so busy and tired now that it's like, fuck. I mean, maybe if you're 18, but um, even when they were old, they were still having, making love every night. It was, and you saw it. You just saw the intimacy, this kind of crackle of intimacy when they were both in the room together. They were two of the most inspiring people I've ever known in terms of their relationship. It was a thing of beauty. It really was. It was so sexy and so alive and so vibrant and so natural. And neither of them were perfect people, but I think they had the perfect relationship and they died within, it's, you know, the trope. They died within weeks of each other mm -hmm. because she could no longer cope with being alive without him and died, just had a, a heart attack or a stroke. I can't remember which actually, it was a, a while ago, but they were gorgeous. And um, seeing that degree of literacy, that degree of literacy was born out of intimacy out of constant exposure to people rather than screens. 
um, they were both so astonishingly intelligent emotionally. And that is only through exposure. And we don't have that anymore because we're relating to screens all the time. We're literally looking at, I, I do the same thing. I'm not pretending to be some kind of superhero who's constantly, you know, on an elevated level. It's modern life. And I am trying to survive and I'm trying to support my daughter and I'm trying to work and I'm trying to have a life as well. And it's fucking hard. This is why I get it because I fuck up constantly on this level. Um, I'm not some Buddha figure sitting there, you know, gazing into people's eyes all day. I, I have the same problem, which is why I'm able to write about it mm -hmm. and why I can see where I'm going wrong and where we, as a culture, where the fuck up starts. It's like, you know, we are all trying to survive. And it's hard on this level and we have lost a lot of intimacy and we've lost a lot of emotional literacy and there is distinct having said that there were other problems at the time because of lack of education and lack of blah blah but the level the capacity for intimacy generally was higher and it really was um, and they, by the way, didn't have a 1950s setup. She was the main breadwinner. <laughs> she was because mm -hmm. he didn't like working. He actually just liked dressing up and playing cards with his friends. So she was actually the main breadwinner. Um, so it wasn't a 1950s setup at all. And in fact, both my grandmothers and my adored grandmother, I write about her in the book. I had a much more intimate relationship with my grandmother than I ever did with my mother. And she was fantastic, but she was a matriarch. She was the main decision maker. So th this idea that I have a 1950s idea is complete opposite. I, the women I'm thinking of when I'm thinking of these, when I'm thinking of powerful female figures, I was, the women I admired were the matriarchs. Mm -hmm. These powerful women who worked, my grandmother worked, she didn't sit at home knitting doilies all day. She wore, she literally wore the pants in the house, the house, actually physically, she was always in trousers, always working. Um, a very competent, very capable woman. Mm -hmm. um, so no, it's not this 1950s setup. I personally, having said that, loved baking. When my daughter was little, I baked all the time. It was just a personal fetish I really enjoyed. Yes, and you write about that quite eloquently in the book. I loved it. I loved it. It was such fun. I've always loved cakes. You know, you mentioned cakes before, so it was a great compliment when you said that. I actually love sweets. I um, loved baking cakes. And no one could believe it. My friends were in a state of shock at this transformation that you know I was always someone who ate in restaurants or takeout and didn't like cooking I wasn't one of those people who loved cooking I in fact now that my daughter's older I never cook anymore mm -hmm. she, she cooks for herself so I'm not but I did love baking and it's something I kind of miss I wish I had the time to do it I don't it was great joy but yeah so when you talk about the past which past are you talking about? The Victorian era, which was a disaster on so many levels. Um, you know, the early 20th century, which was a disaster on so many levels. The 1950s, which were a disaster on so many levels. So I think we've been in a long period of fucked up parenting. Yeah. Uh, but the advantages we have now, uh, standard of living is so much higher. Standard of medical care is so much higher and standard of education. And I think we should use all these advantages to actually change the way we parent so we can take what was good about the past and adapt it. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting we return to you know, the Middle Ages. Um, I'm suggesting that we should we have gone too far in another direction. And mm -hmm. the parenting is, people are being fucked up very seriously. Children are being fucked up. We are being fucked up very seriously. And we need to stop and take note and change 
not completely. I'm not suggesting a 180 degree turn that we all live off the land and kill oxen for dinner. Although that's kind of nice in theory, to be honest, but it's not gonna happen. Um, so what can we do to make it better? You know, so people, so our children don't end up on antidepressants. So their children don't end up being crack addicts. So our children don't end up addicted to porn or trying to kill themselves at 12. How can we change to stop that? That's my interest. Now, since this book came out, since 2015, Yes. It's been something that you might call like a culture war explosion that's happened. Yes. Where um, there's been a very different approach to parenting that's yes. been very popular to articulate for many people over the last six years. And that approach is about trying to make kids resilient, making oh. sure that they're not attached too much and accusing the latest oh, it's hilarious. snowflake it's hilarious. tendencies, uh, bullying tendencies, oversensitivity, yeah. et cetera, on yeah. uh, parents who are way too controlling and trying too yeah. hard to be intimate. What do yes. you say to that response? I just it? think it's hilarious. I remember a mother saying to me, why are, you, why are you so attached with your daughter? And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, don't you think she'd be really upset if you died? And I'm like, um, yeah, she probably would be. Is that a bad thing? And she said, but she has to be more resilient. So she doesn't even need you. And I just thought, oh, this is hilarious. This is like this whole culture that's been badly parented, actually looking for a way to justify their impaired ability for intimacy. You know, it's just, um, excuse me one second. It's all right. It's getting really dark in here. Hang on. Okay. Hi. Sorry, it was just getting really like dim um yeah this this impaired it once again we're back to the justifying the impaired capacity for intimacy it's like i have never known intimacy or if i have it's been inconsistent and unsatisfying and therefore intimacy is the bad guy um I would counsel these people to look at the degree of emotional dysfunction in children who are bullied at school, who are killing themselves. I actually know a couple that happened to. Um, I was bullied myself at school. I stopped eating. So was I. And you, were, you were bullied as well? What were you bullied for? Everything. Really? Everything? Yeah. No, I, I went to quite a tough school when I was in middle school. So I got quite constant bullying. And what happened to you? Um, you mean how was I bullied or, or what happened after? No, what were the repercussions of the bullying on you? Well, originally it made me quite misanthropic. It made me very people hating. Um, then I started to question whether or not I did the right thing and not fighting back because mm. I was a, a boxer as a child. Mm. And I had an experience where I accidentally hurt my father when I was boxing when I was a kid. And I decided after that point, I'm never gonna hurt another human being physically again. So okay. when I got bullied, I let it happen. So I felt a degree of responsibility in the bullying because I knew that if I wanted to, I could have kicked the crap out of all those kids, but I didn't. When you say you accidentally hurt your father, what do you mean? I punched him in the nose and I think I may have broken his nose. <laughs> we were pretend boxing, but I was really boxing and I accidentally punched him in the nose. Were you angry with your father? No, I was trying to be impressive. Did you have any issues with your dad? Uh, not really. He was kind of like my best friend growing up. He was your best friend. Okay. Yeah. So the addiction issues you were talking about before weren't in your father? No, they were in my extended family, which oh, okay. I was quite close okay. to. Okay. So the bullying was a problem with you? Uh, quite badly between the ages of 11 and 14, yeah. Oh, teenage bullying. Wow, that's yeah. really nasty. Okay. Yeah. And is that was, why you attempt is that why you like, attempted suicide? It was part of it, yeah. Um, but I'm very glad I didn't do it. And I had good reasons not to do it. So I'm pleased that I was cowardly. It's not a matter of being cowardly. That's well, really interesting you say that. Why would you assume that not committing suicide is cowardly? 
Well, I don't hold bravery above all other things. I think some examples of bravery can be really destructive. Hmm. Well, I don't think it's a negative thing that I was cowardly in that instance. I think it was a positive thing, but I was attempting to. But just... No, the word the, the word cowardly is a negative word. Um, I don't personally see it as negative, to be honest. Um, well, the, the uh, to call someone a coward yeah. is not a positive statement. Generally, it isn't, but you can have some virtuous cowards, like people who are too scared to do things that, that might otherwise be self-destructive. And I, I prefer them to be scared than to be fully brave and capable. Yeah, but in that, in that case, being scared is, is a constructive thing rather than cowardly. Cowardly implies um, a value system. Um, that's an interesting use of that word, though. I would think about that. You applying the word cowardly in relation to not suiciding. Interesting. I would never apply that. Like when I thought about my suicide attempts, and there were a number of them in my teens, um, because not because of school problems, because of family issues. And, excuse me. Um, and um, I would never say I was cowardly. No, that's the last word I would use. No, no. In surviving them, mm -hmm. I actually see that as triumphant. It's interesting that you have completely different value system. Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that it's valuable to commit suicide. I think what I would say is sometimes character vices can help you do good things. It's a paradox. So um, I did an objectively good thing. I didn't kill myself. I would yeah. have done an objectively bad thing if I did. Sorry, functional and dysfunctional maybe might be better. Yeah. Um, but it was a vice which led me towards the best course of action. No, but I find it interesting because it's almost a Japanese perspective. You know, with seppuku, with this idea of the noble suicide. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting perspective. That's all. The word, the use of the word cowardly reminded me of Mishima and the Japanese perspective of, of suicide, you know, that is just the nobility. And to be honest, the suicide is very brave in some ways. Um, yeah, I think it is, but I think it's it's not generally a good thing to do. It's not constructive. No, it's not constructive, and it's also the byproduct of a completely fucked ideology. But it takes balls. Yeah. So if that makes sense, it takes balls, but it's completely fucked. Um, you yeah. Know, it was it was interesting. I actually when my brother committed suicide, and I wrote a book about that too, called The Eclipse, A Memoir of Suicide, in which I also analyzed his two suicide notes, because there were two. Mm -hmm. There was one on his computer, a draft, written earlier than the other one, and then the final note. And one of the most interesting differences between the two notes was that in the first note, the first note was very, very emotional. There were lots of adjectives, lots of feeling words, lots of you know emotive language. And the second one was very clinical, almost entirely stripped. I don't think there were any adjectives in the second one. I'm not, I can't, off the top of my head, I can't recall, but there were very few if there were any. It was a very, it was almost like a corporate letter of intent. And um, he lied in it spectacularly you know mm -hmm. saying you know nobody has nobody is accountable for this act i'm performing other than myself in effect you know no one's to blame total rubbish um my father was batshit crazy um and he was just it was a statement of fact he really didn't want any in the final note he was absolving anyone else of accountability and interestingly enough, that accountability was a form of connection, of attachment. Mm -hmm. So by saying, for example, I'm killing myself because you were crazy or you did this or you did that or you did the other and I could no longer cope. I was, you know, I didn't, I didn't make the right decisions in response to this behavior. He was actually, would have been, contextualizing himself within other people, a web of relationship, okay? Mm -hmm. 
this domino, this had the domino effect. I did this after you did this. And then I, you know, mm -hmm. whereas in his final letter, it was like, nobody had anything to do with this. This is entirely my decision. I'm completely isolated. This is what I'm doing. So he was asserting his autonomy. No, what he was doing, he was lying. I know my brother, I knew my brother very well. And he was an incredible liar. And he was, he was trying to not make people feel guilty. He was manipulating them. Mm -hmm. Because he didn't want to make them feel guilty. Do you think they should have felt guilty? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, and that would be their point of evolution, where it's like, I feel, my father definitely had a huge hand in this. And I think there would have put, there would have been wisdom in actually making him look at his behavior, which he didn't. He just completely dismissed it as my brother's weakness, rather than seeing his own role in that drama, in that particular tragedy. So here's a horrifying, um, here's a horrifying question. If, if yeah. your daughter at some point in the future ever experienced depression. Yes. And she did kill herself. Would you see yes. that as your fault? I would see myself as part of that equation. Absolutely. And I've talked to her. It's not a horrifying question. It's what we talk about now because she's had issues with depression because of certain things that happened during the divorce, which I am not going to go into um and i have said to her i am responsible in part because i was not able i was being bombarded by lawyers bombarded it was an assault and I can't, as I said, there's a limit to what I am at liberty to say about the situation, unfortunately. But I was not able to meet her needs. And I was also so frantic and so destabilized as a result of threats and things that were going on. That I was just in, insanely kind of at wit's end that certain things were going to happen, that I was not able to comfort her as she should have been comforted. And I was aggressive to her. It's like, dear, stop this and, you know, just shut up and all this sort of stuff. Because I was trying to work and look after her and, and keep track of what was happening because there was so much going on legally. Mm -hmm. And um, the fact that this happened that was is a byproduct of flaws in the legal system, certain things. I mean, in the end, all, all was well with the world, but my daughter was damaged because uh, I, I, I can't tell you certain things. Um, it's okay. For legal reasons. Um, but I'm trying to tell you what I can tell you within my legal... Um, you know, trying to protect her and the rest of it. But she, you know, dealt with the stressed out mother for a long time, mm -hmm. seriously stressed out mother. And this resulted, was a contributing factor to the depression she has struggled with since the divorce. Mm -hmm. So it's in fact the exact opposite of what you assumed, that I would run away from, oh, no, I had nothing to do with this. Mm -hmm. I did. I absolutely did. But the important thing is, as parents, it's not running away and getting defensive because you couldn't breastfeed or didn't breastfeed or because you fucked up. I don't want to look at it because I feel guilty. Bullshit. Look at it. Face it. Accept responsibility. Accept that responsibility. Say, I fucked up. I'm a human being. I said that to my daughter. I said, I am not perfect. I am a human being. And I really, really did do the best I could, which I did demonstrably um but i was not perfect and i was buckling under the pressure and i was you know there were times 
when I was not coping and I was doing the best I could, but I was, what was being done to us was just insane. Mm-hmm. Um, do you I think mean, you really can, wasn't... yeah. Do you think you can forgive yourself for that at this point? Oh, I, I don't see how else I could have acted. The, the whole point is in the circumstance, that's what I was talking, context is absolutely essential. And in, within this context, I don't see how any other reaction was actually possible. It's, it's like, it was in, what was happening was crazy. And the aggression of the lawyers, I mean, it was just nuts. And, and the, it was legal, <laughs> it was legal. And thank God there, particularly in England, there is a movement to change the insanity that is currently permitted by in British Commonwealth family law. Um, the journalist Louise Tickle is doing extraordinary, extraordinary work in this, in this area to stop women and children being destroyed um, legally. <laughs> I mean, the legal, the legal system is, is very flawed in a number of respects, uh, not just in terms of family law, but in terms of domestic violence and sexual abuse law. There are gaps in the law the size of, you know, the English Channel. They need rectifying. And mm. people are, in terms of family law, mothers and children are being just destroyed in, by, by certain things that are going on in the law. Mm-hmm. And um, I'll tell you about a, a, a friend of mine, a nameless friend of mine, um, for example, who she discovered that her husband had been raping her daughter, six-year-old daughter. Oh I was just unthink- unthinkable fucking stuff. Right? And the judge believed them. I mean, why would you? Uh, weirdly enough, I knew something was up because this child was unusually quiet. There was definitely something wrong. She wasn't like a normal child. You know, children are noisy and playful and little. She was very withdrawn. And I, I actually said to my husband, I said, There's some, something's going wrong in that house. And I was right. Um, because I could see that through the child, as I, as I said, the child is always the, the kind of measuring stick unless there's some congenital problem Mm -hmm. and um this woman found out and was distraught the police were called immediately he was booted out she was in court for five years with this guy and the judge believed her all the way and finally she won all the specialists believed her but her (laughs) ever the evidence didn't meet the rules of evidence. There was a particular set of rules. I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know what these rules of evidence were, but the evidence didn't meet the rules of evidence, which is why they were in court for five years, even though everybody believed her and the child, even though Mm -hmm. this guy was lying, obviously, because he didn't want to go to jail. but the rules of evidence were so specific, so precise that they weren't meeting them. And so there was this endless fucking legal bullshit that this woman had to go through. It almost destroyed her. Mm-hmm. It almost ruined her. As I said, in the end, all was well, but she was almost destroyed by the process she had to go through. And it was quite similar to what we went through in a different way. I'm not saying my husband was sexual abusive. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the legal process was abusive. And um, that's the point I was making. And that's the case with family law. And I've known, I've known a number of women. I've also known of abusive mothers, by the way. This isn't gender specific, but it's more commonly because of the cultural construct uh, with women. I've known of women who've actually just couldn't were were not coping with the legal process mm-hmm. and were handing kids over periodically to violent fathers and fathers who abused drugs and things like that simply because they were not savvy enough or strong enough to fight the system mm-hmm. and it's wrong that a woman is in this or a person is in this position where they're actually 
up against lawyers just just in this insane i mean i was lucky because um i'm a fairly tenacious person and also i investigate things thoroughly so i had that advantage over women who didn't who perhaps weren't as tenacious and, or didn't know how to investigate stuff so you know i was able to counter lawyers but um it's hor horrendous mm -hmm. you know, it's really horrendous so yeah so in terms of accountability mm -hmm. i did my best to keep things peaceful i really did because i did not want war but war is what happened mm -hmm. and my daughter suffered as a result, and there was nothing I could do because of the legal system. Right. And she has been scarred. And in terms of accountability, I wasn't part accountable, even though I didn't want it, and I did my best to not have it. But the bottom line is that I was in part responsible. Mm. And that is something I have to live with. Um, and she's damaged as a result of that. How would you feel if she were to say, yes, you did damage me. Yes, yeah. you are accountable for that. Yeah. But I would rather have you as my mother as opposed to some other mother who was completely perfect and didn't damage me at all. I'd rather have you in all your imperfections. Well, that's actually what she says. But the point is, it's what I said to you before. We are not perfect as parents. The idea is not perfection, it's attachment. I am, no one is perfect. No one, no one. Your life, life comes at you. You know, there are curveballs, there are health problems, there are economic problems, there are a million different issues parents have to deal with, with no support. What I advocate in my book is how do we increase attachment as a culture so we can support parents? How do we, you know, I am very much in favor of flexi time with parents so they can both get closer. I'm an, I'm an advocate of parental, uh, paternal leave, maternal leave, a family baby moons for the entire family to advocate attachment. Breastfeeding as an ideal, if the woman can, economically and personally as a means of intensifying attachment and just generally as a culture supporting love, oxytocin things rather than the adrenaline kick all the time, which is what we're after, you know. Mm. So that is actually what my book is about. And yes, of course, my daughter and I are insanely attached, but it breaks my heart that she has suffered from depression as a byproduct of this hideous high conflict divorce I never wanted. Hideous, hideous. Do you think unconditional love is problematic because it makes people excuse the things that their parents did to them because they absolutely. think they have to love them no matter what? Absolutely, absolutely. I think unconditional love is a myth. It's an absolute fucking myth. It's nonsense. This whole idea of, <laughs> The weirdly, you mentioned that my polygamous friend, the one I was telling you about before, actually, he made me laugh so much because he said, um, you know, love should be unconditional. And I said, no, no, you just think that because unconditional love is what you never had as an infant. See, with an infant, love is unconditional. That is the closest to unconditional love that we can ever be because no matter whether the infant cries or kicks out or whatever they do, we still adore them. They can poo everywhere, they can vomit on us, and we still love them. We might get annoyed, but we still love them. That's the most unconditional love. After a certain age, unconditional love becomes destructive because it's like, hang on a minute, hang on, there are boundaries here. You know, in a relationship, there are boundaries. It's like, no, you can't, you can't treat me like that. You can't do this. There are boundaries. And that's actually how a healthy relationship is defined in adulthood. Do you think yeah. it's important? Do you think it's important for a lot of people to learn to stop loving their parents if their parents were abusive to them and didn't give them? I think it's absolutely critical 
to identify abuse in the parental relationship, which doesn't mean that you don't love them. You can still love someone. You can still, for example, I'll give you an example. Um, Andy McDowell spoke a lot about this because her mother was an alcoholic mm -hmm. and she loved her mother madly, but she was also an alcoholic. So her mother failed her on many, many levels, but she also loved her. And what we have to do as, adult, as adults, which is why I was talking before about evolving in, in terms of perspective, is not like your friend who went, I feel judged by her. I'm not going to read it because I feel judged. You know, throw a little grown up tantrum about this. Or when someone says the word breastfeeding, it's like, oh, I feel judged. I feel guilty. It's like fucking own it. You know, if you feel guilty, let's talk about that. Let's open that dialogue. Let's actually have a look at women's needs, the expectations of women, you know, the whole maternal dialogue. Let's put it on the table. Let's look at that guilt. Let's look at that anger. Let's look at all of it. And in terms of our parenting, it's like this myth that parents do the best they can. They really don't, not always. Parents can be phenom parents are people. They can be phenomenally selfish. I think that if people were honest, they can start saying, no, I was really fucking selfish. I prioritized the way I looked over looking after my baby you know, beauty as an idea after looking after, you know, over looking at my baby. And then you can start actually unpacking that. If people were honest, you could start unpacking it and saying, well, what was it that made you prioritize your own appearance over the nurturance of a child? Was it because you felt that you had no status? if you didn't look a particular way, that you could not be loved. And then it gets interesting. Why did you not breastfeed your child because you were worried that your breasts would sag? Did you feel that your husband wouldn't desire you anymore? Did you feel that you lost status? I look at that a lot in, the, in Mama. Mm -hmm. The whole idea of the demotion of women when they become mothers, when they become active attached mothers and the loss of status they experience and the depression and pain and isolation that can result from that loss of status. This is why I advocate honesty about people saying, yeah, I did. I didn't look after my kid. I got a nanny because I was tired. I didn't look good anymore. This is actually a big reason. I wanted to get back to work. It's like, why did you want to get back to work? And the bottom line of it, at the bottom, the core of a lot of this, I wanted to get back to work. I wanted to get my body back. I wanted to be normal again, as if motherhood were a deviation from normality, is status is at the core of a lot of these issues. The reason a lot of mothers stop actively mothering not all mothers who, you know, as I said before, paying the bills is important. But a lot of mothers stop actively mothering because of the loss in status. Because they, they go from being this kind of remunerated, socially relevant person to being what they feel is like this dowdy little nothing in a kitchen breastfeeding a baby. Do you think that, some, that's interesting. Do you think for some women it's it's easier to say something like, I wanna go back to work, I have a career, than say something more difficult, which is I actually don't like this. I don't like being a mother. My view is why don't you like it? Let's look at that. Let's unpack that. That's fascinating. Why don't you like something you are biologically designed to do? Why, why is that bothering you? Why is the, and the bottom line, I think, is the minute a woman says, I didn't like it. I feel more comfortable going to an office or working is because offices are run on a patriarchal system. There are limitations of time. You are remunerated in a particular way. There are rules. There's an increase in status if you obey the rules. It's all predictable. It's all patri It's a patriarchal system. Motherhood is feminine 
it's matriarchal, it's oxytocin-based, it's relationship-based, it's intimacy-based. There are no rules. There's no time system. The baby decides when it's hungry. You have to fit in with the baby. Fuck knows how that happens. There's never any time to do anything when you breastfeed. You are just fucking run off your feet. You're exhausted. You look like a mess. And unless you're 17, most older women will look like a mess when they're breastfeeding. They're, they're just like bags of laundry. There's a loss of status in that, as we were discussing before, because we're in a culture that values a certain kind of body, a certain kind of appearance. And no matter how much you can say, I reject that, it's going to sting on some levels. You know, it's going to sting. I found I lost my body, for example, for about eight years. I almost doubled my body weight. I was huge. I was fat. I loved mothering my daughter in a way that I cannot even begin to tell you how joyous and satisfying it was. But I used to cry at the fact that I couldn't fit into anything anymore. I had an, a wardrobe of beautiful clothes. This is not trivial. This was actually a huge thing for me. Mm -hmm. It was all my life. And all of a sudden I had to adjust to looking completely different in the space of a few months. It's like a completely different body. It's like I was suddenly really overweight. I looked I wasn't one of these women who looks gorgeous when she's overweight. You know, some women look sort of aesthetically, symmetrically beautiful. It doesn't matter if they're overweight. I wasn't one of those. It didn't suit me. It, I, my body expanded in all sorts of weird ways. I didn't, I felt so unhappy with my body. That was really a cause of a lot of examination, a lot of asking myself a lot of questions. Despite the fact that I was very unhappy, that I used to cry, it didn't change the way I parented because my daughter was more important to me. I loved my daughter more than I loved looking good in a suit. Um, but for a lot of women who've attributed a great degree of um, self-worth in their appearance, it's incredibly traumatic. And people don't address this properly. They don't, they say, oh, it's shallow. It's meaningless. It's like, it's fucking not meaningless. If you're a woman and you've grown up bombarded by advertising and images and movies and rock stars and models and the rest of it, and you're in this situation where you've played this game all your life and all of a sudden you fucking double your weight and, you know, your breasts are leaking and your hair's falling out and you've got marks on your face from skin discoloration that's not trivial it's not shallow it's like if i were to take away something that has been very valuable to you all your life whatever that may be with a man it might be money say men suicide like you look at these times during depressions when men are fucking throwing themselves out of windows because they've lost their source of income the same issue of status is at play you know there is status in ape communities. We are hell as apes. Where do you find your status? And what interests me is changing our culture so we change status, the idea of status that we have, because it's dysfunctional. As you say, it's dysfunctional having women who are just beautiful being the dominant value in itself. That's just crazy. You know, it's crazy. Or men having money as the dominant value in itself. That's lunacy. I am suggesting a cultural shift that begins in the kitchen, you know, where we eat, where we sit and look after our babies. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm advocating. And, and go on. Yeah, that's why I look at different aspects of it in the book um, in terms of you know how women who are isolated with babies can come together by doing the sort of mass cooking thing where a lot of women, and it's a way of making friends and having the babies hang out with other babies and doing something, you strengthen a community, you know, and equally to have fathers more involved in families and flex at times so men and women aren't in offices for 16 hours a day. And if you do have childcare, have it on site so you can go to your baby regularly throughout the day or your child. These things, it's like ad adapting, you know, changing even in a small way where we can both be closer. 
because the, the system we've got at the moment is not working. Relationships are fracturing all over the shop. It's not working. You know, people are on antidepressants, people have addictions, people, you know, uh, it, it's just not working. We are not flowing as a culture. You know, we're flowing economically, but we're not flowing on an emotional level. Most people have a sense of just a depression they don't even understand. This sense of lack they don't even understand. And intimacy will heal that on a cultural level. Not overnight, you know, but on a cultural level, it will heal through intimacy. And that's what interests me. It's not people who go, you're judgmental because I didn't breastfeed. It's just they're missing the fucking point. That's not what it's about. It's about, look, let's all acknowledge our weaknesses, our fuck ups, our insecurities. And from that, learn what it is we need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So That's are you I'm... are you of the view that everybody should have children? No. Christ no. Fuck no. No. I say that in the book. No. The most I've got friends it's it's like Julia Gillard, the Australian prime minister. I felt like kissing her when she said I chose not to have children because I recognized that I couldn't achieve what I wanted to achieve whilst looking after a child properly. And I just thought, oh, finally, somebody has said it. This myth that you can have it all is exactly that. It's bullshit. The super, super high achieving women I've known, without exception, have kind of been fucked mothers, the ones who have children. The same principle applies to men. The super, super high achieving guys I know are fucked fathers. You can't do it all. There are 24 hours in a day, you know, and you can kind of what, what you can do is you do it all in at different times. Like you can put this time in your life away for kind of mainly parenting. And this is the time of the life that you get more into career. It's like you you shift priorities at different times in your life. That's doable, but you can't have it all at once. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a myth. And also, in addition to that, some people are just not suited to parenting, and I applaud their decision not to have kids. If mm -hmm. you're intelligent, I've got probably my best friend, my best male friend is, um, is a boxer. Interesting. And um, he's great. He's from South London. He's so brilliant. I love him. He's hilarious. Um, we talk for hours. We get on. People are always it, it's so amused that he and I are so close because he's like this totally tattooed. He could kill anybody. He's just dangerous, right? And he's hysterical and he's a wild guy. Married. Incredibly happily married. Um, they have no kids. He doesn't want kids. He said, we talked about it. And we realized that the kind of fun we love having is just incompatible with parenthood. And I thought, bless you, bless you, that you recognize that you, because they're wild. I won't go into detail, but these are, these are people who like to have fun and they're wild. And he would have been a disastrous parent, disastrous. But he recognized that. And it's like, look, no, we like to party. We like to, you know, I'm a boxer. I like to hit people in the face. I like to do this. He likes to, he has a dangerous, wonderful, wild life. He's adrenaline fueled. And he recognized that that was incompatible with the oxytocin that is necessary for a family. And if more people recognize that, our culture would be a lot happier. The problem is when you get people who are driven by adrenaline, who have kids and they're in the disaster that's interesting so that would almost suggest that like people who want to not slow down who live a very fast-paced life like ambulance attendants who do a lot of very good things in the world maybe shouldn't have I don't, no i don't know if ambulance attendants are right because they're oxytocin based they're caring caring people 
-hmm. their caring is that any way you see caring is oxytocin dominated they even happen to have a, sorry even if it's fast yeah but they they have elements of adrenaline but they're caring based they're healers they're fixers so that by definition would be actually a, probably a very good parent actually because they they can deal with emergencies really quickly mm -hmm. um but i think if you're looking at people like you know um people who like ma ma market traders money market traders and people who thrive on a drum they're not really great parents Th those sorts of people are not great parents people who need the, the thrill the push you know um they're not A friend of mine is a very high level maternal infant counselor. She's the one mothers call in when they're having problems with babies. And she said that the worst mothers she knows, the women she knows who have the most trouble adapting to motherhood are um, managerial, corporate managerial. Mm -hmm. She said they just are fucking disasters when it comes to, to mothering because they're so used to being in charge. They're controlling. They want everything on a schedule. And they do not cope with mothering, which is all about allowing yourself to be directed by the child. Because mm -hmm. the whole point, ideally, early mothering, you let the child direct. The child is the boss. I'm hungry now. It's not hungry at three o'clock when it's convenient. I'm hungry now. I need to be changed now. I'm upset now, but you've got to find out why because I can't speak. So it's completely child centric. And the managerial corporate mother has a lot of trouble adapting to that because they are patriarchal in the way they approach things. They want to schedule. That's how they feel safe. They mm -hmm. need that kind of, that's why whenever you see these women who breastfeed on, on, um, on a schedule, it's, it's, it's insane. It's like this baby's hungry, you know, and it's like feed the baby. Don't sort of, no, you will be hungry at 2 p.m. You will be hungry at 5 p.m. And they're imposing this entire patriarchal model on, um, on the infant, which is a, a problem. And the sleep thing really is exactly the same, that you, you know, the baby has to fit in with your schedule. So it's difficult. What makes it difficult is if you've got, say, let's look at one situation where you have a, a woman who is abandoned during her pregnancy, who has to work. I mean, that's when it gets really difficult for the poor woman. That's why I advocate cultural support, family support, like circling around people with children to make, particularly people, who are disadvantaged in there some way, they, some way they're depressed or they had a traumatic childhood or they're, you know, men too, by the way, I've known men who've had women just walk out on them, leaving them with kids um, for whatever reason, simply because one woman I know got bored mm -hmm. because obviously she had massive intimacy ruptures, couldn't deal with the intimacy and the responsibility. Another person I know was the wife just became a drug addict. And so he was left with the two children, also two children. Um, so they, you know, it's, it's different situations, but the community needs to rally around. And this is what I talk about simplification of life and slowing down and bringing everything down to a much more human level um, rather than just, I've, I've had a lot of people in my life say, why do you become so concerned? about a particular person say like i've helped people i know and they go why don't you just let it go you know they're a, a time drain and i go well, they're not a time drain they're a human being having a difficult time you know and we need to stop the english are particularly good with this i might add it's like we have homeless people and i see so many people stop and talk to the homeless and do things for them here it's actually quite beautiful this was not the case in Australia, by the way, but I see it very, and it, or America, where they no, just walk not. It's what? not. It's not. No, the case it's in America. 
England. No, is but in England, in England, you actually see. I see it all the time. I saw it the other day. People stop. They give them food. They stop and talk to them, and it's like, oh, it's so. I love England. It's one of the reasons I love this country because there's such a strong sense of. People like to look after other people here. Sorry. People like to look after other people. They、here. really do, and it's something that's exquisite about the English. The English are constantly pissing and moaning about how bad England and the English are, and I love the English. I actually、Ew. think they they're beautiful people. You know, that's、um, probably why I became a British citizen. Yeah, it's that's why I the first time I came here, I just thought I feel like I'm at home. It's they are so loving as a nation. It is such a love. Of course, there are exceptions. I'm not talking about every single person or every single law, but I'm saying, as a nation, as a nation of people, they are beautiful,、mm -hmm. and they are much underrated. The English are spectacularly loving in their way, not necessarily emotionally literate, but loving. They try really hard. Well, speaking of emotional literacy. Thank you so、yes. much for talking to me about this book, "Mama: Love, Motherhood, and Revolution" by Antonella Gambotta-Burke. If I said that correctly,、yes. Gambotta-Burke, yeah.、You、get it off on Amazon and a bunch of other places. It's really, really interesting. Hence the conversation. Oh, and if if anybody's still watching at this point or listening,、um, do join me on Instagram, and my Instagram handle is Instagram dot com slash Gambotta-Burke. G A M B O T T O B U R K E, one word, no hyphen. So、um, yeah, do follow on Instagram because there's always information coming up about the new book and other things that are going on.、Um, so yeah, it would be wonderful to see you there. So thank you. You've been absolutely lovely.、Um, I've actually really enjoyed this. You warned me. You said, "Oh, we're going to be looking at things and possibly dredging up terrible things." I've enjoyed all of it. I haven't. There hasn't been anything. In fact, I I loved your more challenging questions. I thought they were really interesting because people who just go on the party line can be a little dull sometimes. Well, it wouldn't be very interesting if it was just another one-hour interview. It's more interesting、yeah. if you have time to go into the thinking behind your thinking. Yes, and also the challenge is always interesting because when you ask it, it's like when you asked about the gay question, two men、um, adopting a child, and I thought, hang on. These are two separate questions, and that made me think. And I thought, no, the issue is actually surrogacy. It's not the homosexuals parenting. It's surrogacy that's a problem. So,、mm -hmm. um, for the baby, by the way,、mm -hmm. for the baby. Yes,、um, no, I, I not, understood what you meant. It was very.、Clear. Yeah, no, no, no. That's that's where I was coming from. But I loved that you made me think that. That's what was really interesting, because I like those sorts of questions because they give me. It's always when someone challenges you. It's like before when I said, "Women need to sit down and actually, or men too, and just talk about the things that annoy them." It's like, and then you unpack that, and that's where you get to the, to the real issue, and that's how you make things change. You know, things don't change if everyone's just rejecting everything that doesn't agree with them. Like, oh, I feel judged, or that's wrong. It's like unpack it all. And pack everything. That's why I get so angry with this kind of cancel culture thing, where it's like, no, we're going to tear down all the statues of Charles Dickens because he supported slavery. It's like, what the fuck, really? What you? What?、Um, I mean, I understand someone who made slavery their driving life force, but it's it's like, look at things contextually, and unpack them from that point. You know. This is Greg Scorzo, and that was the Culture and the Offensive podcast. If you like this podcast, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you're interested in any of the other things that we do at Coda Publishing, check us out at www.cultureandtheoffensive.com. So stay safe, be courageous, and don't forget to go outside of your comfort zone. And remember, when you hear things that sound wrong or silly or stupid or strange, don't forget to use empathy, clarity, and courage. <laughs>